Divine Truth Events These are events and presentations by Jesus and Mary. This presentation is part of the general discussion series. And it is a question and answer session from people in Philadelphia. Presented by Mary Magdalene and Jesus on the 20th of October 2013 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, USA. This is session two, part two. How's everyone found this venue this weekend? Okay? Good? Cool. All right. So, is everyone ready to roll? Yep. You want to ask a question? Um, is this one? Yeah. In regards to uh, anger, when you say, like, hit a pillow or hit a tennis racket and all that, um, well, to me, like, there's, they're just objects. So how can you really release your anger by hitting objects? It's, I mean, you're not really angry at the object. So how does that really get rid of your anger? Because well, I've tried that a few times, and I, it doesn't help me. It doesn't no. help you? <laughs> no. I would suggest, then, it's because you don't want to own your anger. You want to dump it on other people. The thing is, when we dump our anger on other people, we're not releasing it. We're pushing it out onto somebody else. And in that moment, because we feel it's okay to do that, we're saying, it is your fault. And the truth is, our anger is our own responsibility. And that's why when we really want to own it and release it, hitting a pillow does help because we're just allowing the expression of the emotion that's held within us. Whereas when we are dumping it on someone else and blaming them, we're not actually allowing the full expression of that emotion. We're blaming someone else for that emotion. Does that make sense? Yeah, I understand that. But I'm just saying just hitting something doesn't seem to me realistic. Like, Yeah, and I'm saying to you that that's because at the moment you don't want to release your anger. You want to justify it and ho hold on to it. Actually, when we want to really own our anger and release it... It takes very little hitting of anything, I find, more and more. I, sometimes it's just a few seconds and I'm already, like, with the, the emotion that's underneath it, the addiction or the fear or the grief even. Um, so if, if I was you, I would just be working on my willingness to actually recognise that anger is an unloving emotion. A lot of us feel really justified in our anger. Six years ago, I felt like anger was justified in certain situations. And the truth is, from God's perspective, anger is not in harmony with love. And our anger projected outwards onto other people is very harmful. And even held within us is harmful to ourselves. Yeah, I understand all that. But when you're hitting an object, it's still... I just don't see how hitting an object causes... Well, it's not the hitting of the object. It's the desire within you to own and release the emotion. And so some people find that when they have that desire, hitting the object helps them to express that emotion and release it. Other people find just screaming. Uh, sometimes I've just shook in anger to allow it to leave me. But what I'm saying to you is at the moment you have a feeling that anger is justified and that anger is not your responsibility. And that's why hitting an object doesn't help you dissipate the anger. There's a step you have to take before that, which is recognising that your anger is not justified. Well, I think I'm aware of that. <laughs> it's just that... Well, we can agree to disagree. Right. That's OK. okay. <laughs> can, I, can I just say something about that too? Um, you're, you're totally not aware of it, to be frank. Um, you believe you're aware of it in your mind, which is very, very different to having a soul-based awareness of your true feelings. And this is what I notice a lot of people doing with a lot of their emotions. They don't really have a soul-based awareness of their true feelings about a certain thing. So you've been told or heard that anger is unloving and, and all of those kind of things, and you think you believe that in your mind, but the reality is you don't. In your soul, you don't believe that. In your soul, you believe your anger is justified, as Mary has pointed out to you, and you don't want to even see that at this point in time. You don't want to even feel about that at this point in time. Can I ask you what you would prefer to do to get rid of your anger? 
other than beating a pillow or something? What do you want to do? Well, maybe I was thinking, maybe when she says it was shaking might be, because it feels like it's internally coming from you when it's being released. Maybe that seems more What logical. do you do in your day-to-day -day life now with your anger? I just, I guess I hold it in or something. Well, it, you're not doing a good job of that because it comes out of you like as a barrage. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you attempt to hold it in. Mm. I agree. So why do you attempt to hold it in? Because that, I, don't, I, I really don't want to release it on other people, you know. So you're afraid of what your anger might do? Yeah. Yep. Okay. What else can you think of? What do you feel about people who are angry? Well, I, I, I'm not... I guess there's a reason for it. But what do you feel about them being angry? So when I, someone's angry with you, what do you feel? I guess angry at them. Yep, I agree, you do. But, but what's the feeling that causes you to be angry with them? What, what, can, you, can you identify the feeling? Well, because I, that they should do a better job of, I guess, not showing it. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's your belief about yourself as well. Your belief about yourself presently is that you need to do a good job holding on to your anger, covering it over, and not showing it to anybody. And that's what you believe a developed person would do. And that belief is preventing you from experiencing anger. So it doesn't matter what method you use at the moment, you won't get to your anger because there's not a willingness inside of you to get to it because there's so much judgment inside of you about it. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? And what we're suggesting is once, what Mary suggested to you just now is, once you release the judgment and the fear about your anger, then mm -hmm. you'll find you'll get angry fairly more frequently and you'll allow it and, and then you'll find beating the pillow will help you a lot. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yeah. And one, okay. of the, one of the big um, false beliefs I had six years ago was that anger was, uh, I judged it also, just like you judge it in yourself. Um, I, I judged the overt expression of it. But actually, as I mentioned earlier, I was carrying a lot of it in this sort of... Uh, right, I felt it was righteous rage about world issues and things like that. But I, because I never allowed the expression of it and I never owned it as something that wasn't loving, it actually came out of me towards others very strongly. And this is, this is the false belief that, that I used to have and, and that you have now, and that is if I hold it in, it'll do less harm to others. Um, and you have a feeling that if I acknowledge it and let it out, I'll hurt others with it. When actually the reverse is true in that if you, while we're holding it in, others feel it from us like a big barrage, and when we actually get to this point of deciding, I'm going to own it and release it for myself, and I'm going to feel it, it actually harms less and less people. Uh, so it's just something, obviously, that as you've grown up, you've grown to judge anger, or maybe you were really punished for being angry in your childhood. But this false belief, and this also I feel in you this feeling that sometimes anger is... Okay, if people aren't loving, then yeah, I'm okay to get angry with them. Or if I don't get exactly what I want, mm, it's okay right. to be angry, mm. you know. Uh, just before the break, when we said, no, you need to leave your question till after, there was some anger that came out of you then at that time. So these are the kind of, these beliefs that you have where you feel like it's okay to be angry in that circumstance because this person's not being reasonable or whatever. That's some of the stuff that if you're going to come to grow towards God and actually grow in love, you'll come to recognise that, oh, anger's never justified. And when you start to work through those false beliefs, then you'll find your anger flows out of you more freely. Okay. Right. And remember that anger is always a cover of your addictions and your fears. So, so in the end, the goal isn't just to experience anger, but rather to get to see what your addictions really are. And so most anger is caused by a desire to control, a desire to get what you want, a desire to get what your addictions are met, a belief inside of you that people should do whatever they should do for you. 
and things like that. That's what creates the anger in the first place, these false beliefs about love and what love would dictate. So, so whenever we have any false beliefs about love, usually it creates anger. And, and most people, I find, find that difficult to acknowledge and feel in the sense that they don't realise that what's coming, at, uh, what, what's coming out of them towards other people is a result of their own demands not being met inside of themselves. And often these demands we believe are loving demands, but any time we have a demand, it's not loving. So, so if I expect you to treat me lovingly, automatically I'm out of harmony with love. Right? You don't have to. According to God, you don't have to. You've got free will. You're allowed to do anything you want, including being unloving to me, if that's what you want to do. And, I don't, and as soon as I expect you to be loving to me and then get angry when you're not, I am showing one of my own addictions. And it doesn't matter what you did. Like you, I'm not saying it's right that you're angry with me. I'm just saying that even if you are angry with me and I get angry in return, I'm not right. Does that make sense? I'm the person who's not examining where I'm out of harmony with love. So, so a lot of times we have these, um, what I feel are quite strong justifications, as Mary's pointed out, of using anger. We have um, the, the primary reason why we get angry, really, is because we want to control our environment in some way. That's the primary reason. And so every time we get angry, there is a lack of love or a lack of understanding about love. But the key is to not condemn that within yourself, but to acknowledge it and allow its expression so that you can find out what it is that you're afraid of and what addiction you have that's out of harmony with love. Because if you don't allow the expression of the anger emotionally, you won't find out what addiction drives it. You won't find out what fear drives the addiction that drives the anger. So con desire to control is not really an addiction, it's covering an addiction, is that? That's correct. Yeah, the desire to control is not really an addiction, it's covering a fear. So what, you know, all of these things, anger and addictions, all cover fears. That's the point of them. That's why we create them. We create them because we want our fears to be assuaged, you know, to, to go away. We want them to disappear and we're not prepared to feel them. And so what we do instead of that is we hold on to them and then we use addictions and then rage or anger, if the addictions are not met, as a tool to control our environment. And that's what... So the whole attempt to control is not an addiction itself. It's, a, it's, a, it's an avoidance of fear that causes control. So... So in a relationship, if you're trying to control your partner, it's avoiding a certain fear. That's why you're trying to control them. If in a, in a work situation, any other driving car, any other situation where you're trying to control other people, it's to avoid fears. There's been whole religious faiths created to avoid fear. So, you know, the whole... Uh, for example, most religious faiths are created by a few elect people who are afraid that other people might be immoral if they don't have a religion. So, so what they do is they create a whole heap of laws, you know, like the Ten Commandments, a whole heap of laws that uh, are all really based around trying or attempting to control a group of other people because the persons who made the laws are all afraid of what will happen to the other people or themselves if everyone doesn't follow those laws. So you'll be surprised even in our culture and also in the entire world's history what's being created just because of trying to avoid a fear. And if you look at religiously, there's, people have gone to war to enforce the commandments that have been created by other people. <laughs> and why have they done that? Because they feel a huge level of fear that if you don't follow those commandments, God will do something to you, you, you know, you won't have God's approval or you won't have God's acceptance or you, you'll, you know, lose everlasting life or you'll lose some kind of future existence or you'll go to hell or whatever the belief is. And these belief systems um, have been created most of the time because somebody historically wanted to control and all of the desire to control comes from their, their own fears. So we've got a whole religious face created because of fear We've got whole political systems created because of fear. We've got whole environmental and, and systems created because of fear. Economic systems created because of fear. Because we're all too afraid. 
And, and we all don't want to feel fear, so we create all of these addictions and all of these controls in order to get away from fear. So to be frank with the majority of, in, in, in everyone's case, fear is your primary enemy in a lot of ways. Now, you can view it as an enemy or view it like I view it. I view it sort of like a friend because it tells me everything about myself that I've yet to heal. So every time I feel a fear, I go, ah, you know, this is really good. I, I can feel that fear I've got going on here. Like, let's say it's a fear of somebody's violence. I can feel that fear. What are you prepared to do to avoid somebody's violence? Well, most people are prepared to be violent in return to avoid somebody's violence or even to be preemptively violent. In other words, do something to the other person before they do something to you. And with myself, I go, okay, I feel this fear and if I live in it, it's going to be my enemy. But if I feel my fear and work my through, way through it, it's going to help me, therefore, be my friend. It's going to help me grow. And so the key is to start seeing fear as our friend. But for the majority of us, we don't want to feel fear. It's a terrible emotion to feel. Most of us who have ever felt it would say it's probably one of the worst emotions to feel. And, uh, and so what we have a tendency to do is either, either overcome it so a lot of men, what they do is challenge their fears constantly in a desire to overcome their fears. Or we do what a lot of women choose to do, and that is completely deny it altogether and just live in addiction or rage. Um, and that's what we do. So trying to overcome a fear doesn't really eliminate it? No, not at all. What you need to do, there's only two things you need to do to feel fear. One, put yourself in a situation where you are afraid. Two, allow yourself to feel the terror itself allow yourself to feel it as a feeling. That, that's the only two things you need to do with fear. It's really simple, dealing with fear, but you try doing it. <laughs> it's, it's really hard when you try doing it um, because most people start feeling the fear and then the, they'd want to do anything other than that, anything. And, the, you know, people will do all sorts of things just to stay away from fear. They'll even murder to stay away from fear. Why do you think there's around 50 million abortions every year um, around the world? because there's 50 million women and men who want to avoid certain fears and they're willing to murder children to avoid those fears. Like we're, as a society, we're willing to do so many things just to avoid a fear. And, uh, and there's only two, uh, there's only, we only have to do two things. One, place ourselves in a situation where the fear is triggered. Two, allow ourselves to feel the fear. We don't have to take any other action, but most people don't do that. Most people take an action to help their fear go away. Yeah. Mm. And we, we will do, like, mankind historically has done terrible things to avoid fear. Terrible things. You know, we're, we're even willing to create an arsenal of nuclear weapons to avoid fear that's so big that if it was all unleashed at one time, it would completely destroy humanity. That's how, how willing we're able to go to avoid the fear of security, for example, personal security. Like, that's, you know, if you look at all of the things that you, are created on the earth that we're all, and, and ironically, it heightens that fear. Now everyone's afraid somebody's going to push the button sort of thing, you know, like, well, don't create the weapon in the first place. That would surely be the best answer. But, but unfortunately, that's what we do because we're already afraid and we don't want to acknowledge it and we don't want to feel it. And so what we do is we project it and we create circumstances around us that cause our fear, in fact, to increase in most cases. And that's the law of attraction in work. Yeah. But fear is one of the biggest emotions that each person on the planet will have to, at some point, choose to feel rather than choose to avoid. And most of us don't. We choose to avoid, manipulate it, get away from it, do something to, to you know, manoeuvre around it. That's what we do with our fear. So all of your anger, pretty much all of your anger, is caused by fear. Now, that's a well-recognised psychological fact, actually. Most psychologists would say to you that all of your anger is caused by fear. Of course, they draw the line at some things, like... They draw the line at fear of death. That, that, that to them is a justified fear. And to me it's not. There's no such thing as death anyway. You know, you live forever. So 
whether you live here in a physical body or live in a spirit body, it doesn't really matter. You're living forever. So to me, there is no justification of doing something even when you're faced with death. But the average person on the planet who doesn't believe those things will go, no, there are certain times when your fear is justified. And everyone on the planet has some justification of the fear that exists inside of themselves where they don't want to feel it. Yeah. Yeah. And particularly the justification of fear of death. Most people are very, very afraid of death at all sorts of levels. Or the death of a loved one. Some yeah, the, the break, in particular, death usually causes for most people what they perceive as the breakage of a relationship that they want to hold on to of some kind, or a breakage of the relationship with Earth, or a breakage of their ability to use their body in ways that they'd like to use it. They feel that that's not going to be possible. And so they have all sorts of fears that govern why they will prevent death at all costs, prevent their own death, I mean. And they're willing to shoot another person to, in other words, kill another person to prevent their own death. And that's fear mm. that causes us to do that. If we're not in a state of fear, we don't feel that way. We would never be willing to shoot another person or harm another person just to prevent our own death. Yeah. But see, these are all things that are justified on the planet at the moment. And so if you allow yourself to feel it, there are, the world around you justifies a certain level of fear. You know, if you read any psychologist uh, manuals or books, you'll find that there's a justification of certain types of fear when, when it comes to self-preservation. There's a justification of all sorts of fears. So while psychologists acknowledge that anger is created by the denial of fears and the, unaccept the lack of acceptance of the emotion of fear, they also support that in certain circumstances. And that might be they support it in the circumstance where your own life is threatened, for example. And so many psychologists, of course, would support war rather than saying that war is unnecessary. And it's all because of fear in the end. Yeah. Fear is the work you're going to have to do at some point. In fact, it's going to be the main work you have to do. Because if you'd had no fears right now and you really had a desire for God right now, what would happen? You would already be at one with God. Does that make sense? You'd already be at one with God. If you had no fear and a desire to have received God's love, you would have already received God's love right to the point of at one with God. It's only your fear that prevents it. So... It's always fear that you've got to do most work with. And that applies to me as well as yourself. <laughs> anyway, sorry about that. No need to apologise for that, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I wanted to wrap up the long-winded answer to the question that Dan posed yesterday. And that was to talk a little bit more about the way I see... Um, AJ, expressing love in action. Um, and I'm calling it love in action because I see the potential for all of us to express, to demonstrate love, to embody love in this way. Um, I just happen to have the privilege of witnessing it every day and that's really lovely for me. So, and we've talked about how in the beginning it wasn't so lovely, but um, it is really lovely. Yeah, so... Um, I suppose some of the things I'm going to write on this list might not surprise you, but if you would like I w to hear, I would like to demonstrate this with examples of things that I've experienced or things I observe, because I feel like we talk about words like humility and love and truth a lot, but when it comes to really living those principles, a lot of us kind of fall down and go, oh, what's, what's humble in this situation? Or how does this work? Or, so um, hopefully this will help you to reflect a little bit on your own experience and your own uh, experimentation with the principles of divine truth. So uh, it's no surprise that I'm going to tell you that my guy is really humble. <laughs> But to talk about that a little bit 
um, with examples from real life. Uh, I wanted to do that a little. I already mentioned earlier that um, through all of this drama that I was projecting outwards when we first met, when none of my addictions were being met and all of my perceptions about what I thought was loving were being challenged, um, and I was dumping a lot of anger and blame towards AJ, he was experiencing his emotions about that. So instead of blaming back, and you know, if anyone has a case for saying, this is really not fair and I would like you to, you know, you're hurting me, uh, and to blame back, he never did that. He did draw the line in the sand many times and say, this is not on and we can't have a relationship based on, on you treating me like this. So, this is not helping either of us, me accepting these emotions from you. But throughout all of that, he didn't ever say, you're a bad person for doing this, you are the problem here, uh, you're to blame for the pain I'm experiencing. He said, this is, he said, but he felt, this is pain that's already within me. This is exposing things within me. And he would go and feel about it. And in the first few years of our relationship, he grew far more than I did because I wasn't being humble and he was. I was pushing out a lot of stuff and he was, instead of pushing back, grieving and feeling, realising what he would have to face in order to continue to love me. And within that, and something that's very powerful and moves me a lot, is that he forgave me a lot. And by forgiveness, I'm not saying he went, oh, it's okay, dear, you know. Who can tell me what forgiveness really is? What's involved in really forgiving another person? Over here, yep. Feeling how um, the behaviour of that person makes you feel, fully feeling the feelings, like what you've been talking about. So it's feeling, it's not thinking it, it's feeling it. Once yeah, again, and course. it's not kind of intellectually uh -huh. understanding why they're doing it. But actually, yeah, because I know for me, that going into understanding kept me always, was a great way of denial. It was an incredible way of denial. Yes. Yeah, like it, I mastered that one really well. <laughs> It's very popular, isn't it, kind of on what we would call the natural love path. Oh, just feel what, you know, where they're coming from, understand them. And I always say it's sort of like you have to, like, get together at Christmas and you know, all this stuff comes up with the family and it's like, oh, these people are driving me crazy. Or for some people's family, if, in my family, it was like, oh, we're in codependent addiction. It's lovely. But... <laughs> But for some people, it's family time. Oh, my gosh, these people are making me crazy. And then oftentimes we've been told, just understand where they're coming from. And, you know, that'll be forgiving them. And, you know, then you get to this place of peace with them. And you just, you know what's going on for them. And, and then I always say, that works maybe for half an hour at the end of Christmas lunch. But, like, at Easter or the next family holiday, there you are again going, ah, oh, got to do it again, remember. Whereas... True forgiveness it involves, it comes from a desire to really love that person. So we can't do that without already having a pure desire to actually remain loving that person. And then a willingness to really feel what that experience has been like when they haven't been loving towards you or when, that, when something has happened that you feel really sad about or afraid about, is being willing to feel all of that fully and let it go. Then there's no effort in trying to understand. Understanding does come, but it's, there's, a, there's love accompanying it. And so I have received this many, many times from my soulmate. And I observe him um, practicing this in our day-to-day -day life with a lot of people. A lot of people are very condescending to a guy who is not performing miracles, uh, who who's, doesn't big note himself, he doesn't like walk into a room and demand everyone's attention, but he's saying he's Jesus. And a lot of people just go, oh, there's a feeling. Uh, and I feel it <laughs> everywhere we go, pretty much like, oh, yeah, come on. What's with this guy? 
So there's, the, and if I can feel it, someone who's far more sensitive and my, far more open feels it a lot more strongly. And yet I have probably once in the six years that I've known him, seen him waver from a place of just love with people because he's gone through a process of grieving what that feels like to be on the other end. And recently we had an experience, we went to lunch with some people and um, there was a group of people there and they were people from my past that I'd grown up with, old family friends, and we'd been invited to lunch and they'd invited some other people for lunch at the same time and it was kind of like the elephant in the room. No one wanted to talk about the fact that we're Jesus and Mary Magdalene. And, and all of a sudden, this one guy who, who was just more open just went, look, right, I know about all this claim stuff. And, you know, frankly, I'm not that impressed by you. And, like, and just sort of kind of launched into this, this whole thing. And I was sitting there feeling ugh, ugh, attacked, mortified. I started to get a bit sort of antsy with him. I was saying, oh, excuse me. Like, every time AJ would go to say, like, respond to a question he would ask, he'd talk right over the top of him. And, and I wanted to say, hey, this guy's being more loving to you right now and you're not even... And you're saying you're not, he's not impressive enough. And from where I'm sitting... But there wasn't much love in me about it. I was feeling pretty cranky. And when we left... <laughs> when we left, I was talking to AJ about it and he said... He didn't waver from it. He was calm, just loving. When it was obvious the guy didn't really want to hear from me, he just, you know, talked to someone about the salad and it, w- it was okay with him. And uh, when we left, he said to me, yeah, you were really upset at that guy, hey? And I was like, oh, it just gets me the way people don't see, you know, what they're in the presence of. They want, you know, some big, like, metaphysical experience and yet love's being displayed right there in front of them. And that gets me. And oh, okay, no, I've got an issue. But AJ said to me, I enjoyed that guy's company more than anyone else at the lunch. <laughs> he was more real than anyone else at that table. Um, and, you know, I, I felt all my feelings, Mary, about people feeling like I'm not fancy pants enough to be Jesus and that I know what they're looking for and, you know, it's okay. Uh, so that was just such a powerful demonstration to me of this is not just... and We're not just up here talking to you about humility that is doesn't affect your whole life and in really tricky situations. You know, this is this is this man practices what he preaches. There there are situations where there's no justice. There's no um, people in the media have been really uh, duplicitous with us. They've told us a big story and done the opposite. They've told big lies about us, and there's been no justice in that. You know, and if we wanted to, I'm sure we could sue them or, or whatever. But what I see reflected in my guy is that he feels about those things. And a lot of us, we're okay to feel, maybe, when, when justice is on our side and when everyone sees that there's something wrong and maybe we'll feel about it then. But when, every, when the world's really not seeing our point of view or when there really has been something done towards us that's not kind and not loving, a lot of us throw out the principle of humility right then. We don't want to feel our pain about it. And we just get into, no, but they need to fix this thing, you know. And so this is where I see where these principles that we talk about, where the, you know, where it really meets practice is when we're willing to be humble and in all situations. And this is how we really forgive and as someone who's received forgiveness many times, that is uh, just, it's life-changing, really. And I don't know that many of us have received that before, but it's certainly in a real, real sense where someone has been brave enough to feel all of the emotions involved in the way that we have harmed them and been able to forgive us. But having received that feeling from somebody else, it's certainly inspired me that I want to be able to do that for others. But I know that's going to require humility in every situation, 
even when I feel like there's so much evidence on my side that I shouldn't have to feel about this thing, that I want to change it rather than feel it. Um, but there's so much power in this quality of humility. And I see how much it enables love. Without that, we can't love because we're invested in, in maintaining or avoiding a certain set of emotions. It's only when we're willing to really feel everything that we make space for love to enter us from God, but also to come from us towards others, our own natural love. So that's, that's the first point. <laughs> um, okay. We'll go for the big ones straight up. Again, truth is something that we talk about probably every two to three minutes in a seminar that we give. And um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the way I see AJ honouring truth. Um, Because, and we we touched on this a little bit when you were talking about fear. Um, I see that he honours truth, and by this I mean God's truth, about situation, about any circumstance, above any personal emotion he might have about that situation or circumstance. So that means when we're having uh, our troubles or when we're having a disagreement, he's concerned with what is God's truth about this situation. And even if, remember when I was speaking earlier about when I wanted to do things to please him, or I, wanted to, I just wanted to do the right thing, even though I, my whole heart wanted to run in the opposite direction. He would always be challenging me and saying, Mary, the truth is that you don't want this. So even though I might really hurt that you don't want to be in a relationship with me anymore, we need to honour this truth. We need to, you need to do what is truthful for you right now. And I'll feel anything that comes up as a result. And I see him do this in every situation that we encounter in our life. There's this honour of God's truth. And it's something, it's a lesson that has touched me deeply and one that I feel myself beginning to embrace. And that is that if we honour God's truth in every situation which is really honouring God's laws, then even if there's some kind of short-term terror, pain, grief that's triggered, I know that in the long run, the very, very best thing for not just me, everyone involved in this situation will have the potential of coming about. And without that, it can't, I'm, I'm limiting God's potential in this scenario because I'm not honouring the basis of of his universe, which is his, his truth and love and laws. And I see AJ doing that constantly. He, um, he'll often say, or when, when a situation presents itself, often we don't feel ready. We're like, what? We're going to go like prime time, England, TV. Um, but there's a trust in him. I don't know, maybe you felt more ready than that, <laughs> for that than I did. But the, I... I know many times you've said to me that, well, God obviously thinks I'm ready. So even if I don't really feel it, I'm going to trust that because I've attracted it. And so I'm going to honour the truth in this situation. I'm going to do what's truthful because this situation has presented it to, presented itself to me, so I'm going to engage it. And similarly, he doesn't rush it if it's not being presented. We're not out there trying to beat up publicity or, you know, generate more people coming to our seminars because obviously our souls aren't ready yet because we're not attracting. We're, we're attracting exactly what God feels that we're ready for and the, the lessons that we need to work through during this, during this period of our lives. And when we're more ready, we'll attract different things. So this, this honour of truth and really God's laws. It actually kind of reduces a lot of your workload as long as you're humble. 
Because all you have to do is engage with the thing that God's brought you right then and there in truth, honouring the laws, so not breaking your ethics or principles and just trusting, and this is really God-reliance we're talking about now, trusting that that's going to lead to the, to the most growth for you and everyone involved in the situation. And being willing to be humble in those situations enables your growth. Are you frowning at me, honey? Do you want to? <laughs> You're just feeling uncomfortable because I'm talking about you. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, and I suppose under this is just the faith that I just mentioned, you know. I just see this deep and very real faith that AJ has that you cannot manufacture from your mind. This is a soul-based feeling that if we engage with God's laws, good things will happen. And this is another place where I see his humility. He... he he gives credit where it's due. He, doesn't, he knows that his progress is based on his will and he, if, if he encounters something which is out, he can feel is out of harmony with love within himself, that is his number one priority, to deal with and look at. at how many of us can say we're like that? We're often, in a day sometimes, I rack up five or six things where I go, oh, yep, oh, oh, yep, got to look at that, got to look at that. But do I make it my priority in terms of feeling and healing that thing? Not always and not very often, if I'm really honest. And this is where I see if we really want to put love into action, we take those things very seriously because we know every one of them is something that's preventing us being loving. And, and I see this in my lovely soulmate all of the time. Um, yeah. So he, he is, it takes seriously and takes responsibility, I suppose I want to say. And within this taking responsibility is acknowledging something that I think we touched on briefly at the end yesterday, which is about recognising that we don't live in a bubble. We are all connected. And when I use my will out of harmony with love, it is going to affect people around us. And yesterday there was a fair few questions about, but that doesn't feel fair, you know. <laughs> what, what about this, you know? I don't think that it's fair that God allows this to happen when actually I feel that God is trying to show us the power of our will in action. We create all the time with our will. And we have a choice to have loving creations or unloving ones. And if we choose the unloving ones, it's going to affect other people, not just us. That's a truth that God is trying to help us see. And um, part of being humble is taking responsibility for the fact that if I've got something that's unloving inside of me and I leave it there, it's going to affect not just me but other people around us. Every relationship I'm in, every child that I have, my own relationship with God. And so I see um, AJ taking these things very seriously. And there is a deep, deep level of self-reflection within the man. And I, I often see people kind of talking um, randomly about, oh, yeah, the law of attraction, this is what I'm attracting. But really, to really look at ourselves and look at our lives, it means that literally, you know, minute by minute, we're talking about, wow, that person just brushed me off. Or, yeah, or in my case at the lunch, yeah, I did, okay, I've got to be real. I didn't feel that loving towards that guy in that situation. So that's showing me something. Um, the way our baggage is handled, all, all kinds of things we're looking all of the time. How's God trying to show me a truth? How's God trying to help me see something that's out of harmony inside of myself? So um, taking responsibility involves a lot of self-reflection as well. And um, that's something that... I thought six years ago I was pretty self-reflective and I had no idea. <laughs> Uh, 
And I suppose the other thing that I see really strongly in AJ and that I feel is so essential if we're going to put love into action is about recognising that um, this self-reflection is about being responsible. But the main thing that we can, the only thing we can really be responsible for are those things inside of us that are out of harmony with love. They are, that's the only thing we can change. And I often see in relationships or in people, in day-to-day life, we get caught up in how other people have to change. But really, if we are actually ever going to love, be able to give love and receive love from God, we're going to have to look at those things within us that are out of harmony with love and stop focusing so intently on the things inside of other people that are out of harmony with love. Because they, in the end, are their responsibility. And the only way to grow ourselves is, yes, to be open and feel what's happening around us. And if there's something out of harmony with love and it brings up something for us, yes, feel that. But know that we're responsible for what's in here. And no one else can be responsible for that or help take that away except for God. And also, we can't really force someone else to take responsibility. And this is uh, probably leads me to the next point, which is the way that I see... AJ, on a free will. And this one is hard for me to describe, probably because I see AJ on a free will in the most, in the finest sense of the definition, I suppose. He as we mentioned in our relationship, he always wanted me to to have my will. If he could feel like I was trying to deny my will or modify my will to please him, he would, you know, draw a halt to it completely. And I mentioned also when people have, like, negative opinions of him. He doesn't try to control that in any way. He doesn't try to work harder to impress them or, or defend himself to other people. He just allows them. And a lot of people think that that's, he's quite passive and weak. But I just see him being actually quite firm and strong in allowing them their own experience and their own opinions. Um, and this, this, is a, this is an aspect of honouring another person's free will. People don't have to be just towards us. They don't have to like us. And actually, when we try to manipulate them into liking us or doing what, doing what we think is right, we're not honouring their free will. And so I, I see this in action very strongly. But it gets probably even finer than that. And um, again, it's a soul-based feeling that I have uh, living with AJ. But I'm just trying to think of some examples when he's doing an interview. So recently we had a lot of radio interviews internationally and AJ would be sitting in our office talking to people in different parts of the world, in Africa or Ireland or or whatever. And sometimes, because they want to screen him for being a bit loopy, (laughs) before he... (laughs) Before he... That's probably the most honest way I can say it. Before they put him on live radio, the producer will often call him and have a chat with him. And the same thing before we went to England. A a producer called and had an hour-long chat with him about, you know, who he was and what we were doing. He's spoken more to producers than he has to actual presenters because we went to England and we were on air for maybe seven minutes, I think. But I spoke to someone for about three-quarters of an hour and you spoke to someone for a couple of hours probably in the end, a few different people. But... I started to notice this thing that was happening. When the producer would call, it would be like maybe eight times out of ten. It would be just a beautiful conversation. And AJ would just be having a great time and they'd be responding and having a joke with each other. And you could feel there's a lot more information or a lot of information was coming out of him about his life, about divine truth, about all of these things. And then the radio... Uh, the actual live radio interview would happen. And on a couple of occasions, there, there was a similar feeling. But for the main part, I could feel AJ was fine, but he just wasn't sort of... There just wasn't as much flow and not as much information got transmitted. And, and then I would listen to the full radio interview, I'd hear the presenter, and I would realise, oh, they just don't want to know as much. So... Uh, 
he's not even thinking about it. He's just not giving as much information because he can feel that they don't want to know. And I observe that even in our day-to-day interactions with people. Um, a lot of people at home who've heard divine truth for like five or six years feel like it's like, I don't know, some kind of God-given role to seek people out in their workplace and tell them the divine truth. And I'm always cringing because I think, did that person even ask you anything about anything? <laughs> like, this concept of free will is fairly important. Um, And to contrast that with what I see AJ doing is that, you know, we have interactions with people in our community. Often we buy things, we go places or or that people deliver things and we we chat to them about themselves and their lives and if they ask us, we talk to them about ourselves. But we certainly never force anything we teach on anyone. We, We wouldn't even dream of it. And in the context of even in a seminar, um... We kind of have a, we have a feeling that if you're sitting in a seat, you've, you obviously have some desire to hear truth. So we're, we're more direct with a, with a lot of people who are in our audiences. But I see AJ even responding within that context. When someone is really close to truth, he's more likely to just say, you're quite close to the truth right now. <laughs> and, and be far more open with people who, they might even be saying exactly the same thing as the other person, but their heart is more open, and so he's honouring their will. They want to know, I'm going to give them as much as I can. And in fact, because he sees that this truth, that truth is the doorway to growth, he's always very thorough in his explanations. Have you noticed that? Uh, Some people find it really irritating. Uh, Scott. What? And when, look... To, to tell you about me six years ago, the first contact, the first kind of, um, it wasn't the first contact, but nearly the third or fourth contact I had with AJ was like a two-line email. He was already overseas somewhere and it was about, look, I'd like to know, I've heard that maybe you think we're soulmates, I'd like to hear from you about it. Mary. Uh, not giving anything away there, not feeling, not, it was just direct and he wrote me back, like, I don't know, it was, maybe if I printed it, it would have been, like, eight or ten pages. Because, um, <laughs> you know, if the guy's going to say something, he's going to give you all the information. So there's no room for misunderstanding or false assumptions. And that is an act of love. That's love in action. But for me, because as time went on, we started to have a few more conflicting... uh, I was in a lot of conflict and I would write something and he would write back and point out the truth to me about what was going on. And just so you don't feel too terrible, Scott, I would be at the the computer monitor and I would... One paragraph, two paragraphs, and then I'd be like, I can't read it. (laughs) And I'd have to walk away for half an hour just seething because I knew what he was saying made logical sense, but could he just stop saying so much? And uh, could he just, like, oh. Um, and it took me a long time to really have gratitude for, the, for the, the time and consideration that he took in showing me and really explaining this thing to me so that I could actually understand better. Uh, and this, this honouring of truth means honouring that Truth is the way that we grow. Unless we see truth, we can't open to the emotion that's in disharmony with it. Uh, or we, can, we cannot receive it, really, unless we open to it. And so he, this, this, um, this thoroughness in talking to people... And often, AJ, like, people are really, like, throwing some hate out there. But if he feels like there's, there's a feeling within them somewhere that they really, you know, they want God or they want to grow or there's a principle involved that's being ignored, he will explain it really, really thoroughly so that people under, have the opportunity. He's enabling their free will to actually make a choice to see something. Um, he said to me recently, because I have, because of my fear, I often have the the opposite problem. I'll just tell people in two sentences and hope you join the 
dots and get really the deep meaning of us. And sometimes we'll, <laughs> he'll, we'll, um, we'll talk to people individually and he'll say, oh, yeah, I talked to so-and-so and they got this thing. And I'm like, I told them that. And then I think, yeah, I probably didn't really tell them in a lot of detail. I hoped that they got what I was saying. Um, but I remember you said to me recently, you've got to dot the I's, Mary, and cross the T's, otherwise they'll just think it's all L's. And... <laughs> And it's very true. Like when we talk in generalities and use certain terms, other people are coming from a different place about what that term actually means. And so part of love in action is actually really desiring that the other person understand what you're saying um, when, when they've asked, when they've asked to know. So, yeah. I, I often have a chuckle about how many people are triggered by hearing so much content. <laughs> okay, I want to just um, check what else I had written here. Oh, yeah. So, something about love in action is that it always seeks resolution. Do you know what I mean by that? What do you think I mean by that? Anyone? Yeah, Katarina, yeah. Uh, perhaps to make sure that if there's a dispute or any difference of opinion, that you reach an end, that you reach an understanding in both parties. Yeah, that you resolve the issue. That you, that you want, that you desire for there to be a resolution. Right, an understanding complete from both sides, that this is what I said, this is what you said, and we agree on that now. <laughs> well, <laughs> that not we necessarily that we, that, understand that we understand it based on, and so it's not necessarily about compromise, it's about based on principles of love and truth. And so there's been times in our relationship where we have spoken about something that's current for both of us, like a, a problem between both of us, for two days straight. You know, we don't do anything else. We eat, we sleep, we... But the rest of the time, we're seeking a resolution on this issue. We want to get to a place where there's going to be movement in the direction of love for both of us. Now, a lot of us in our relationships do a lot of other things than that, don't we? And we carry things on for months or years. It's like a simmering, festering thing within a relationship for a long, long time. And every time there's a bit of stress put on the relationship, we're, we're back at that issue again, aren't we? And there's all this unresolved feeling that comes out and, and all, of these, all of these things that we've been keeping inside are suddenly wham in the face. And... Um, something that we both acknowledge now, and it's something that AJ's always had, um, is that when we love, we, wa we want to seek this resolution in terms of love and truth. So it's not about compromising and just reaching an agreement. It's about is there going to be a forward movement in love in our relationship? And until there is, we can't, this, this is the issue. This is what we're going to look at. Um, and I know for a lot of you that doesn't happen. You, there's almost a sense of feeling of hopelessness about it won't ever be resolved, so why bother going there? And that's actually in direct disharmony with the way God created your soul and the whole universe. He's designed it towards growth and truth and love. And when we give up, we, we give up on the potential for that. Um, yeah, so this is, this is a really beautiful thing that I value in our relationship a lot now that I didn't always value. <laughs> because I wanted to sweep some things under the carpet because, frankly, oh, it was painful or frustrating or, or whatever. Um, but it, it wouldn't have helped us get to the place that we're at now. And, and hopefully it's something that will keep us going in the right direction. Yeah. Okay. Um, probably... This one is maybe a little bit surprising, um, but I see this very strong desire in my soulmate for himself. And this is actually a part of loving, is to want to know ourselves and express ourselves 
and to, to be ourselves. And many of us don't have that desire and that really stunts our ability to actually love. Because unless we have that desire, we're not even loving ourselves. And love is not one of these things that's mutually exclusive. Like, in order to love you, I have to have some love for myself. I can act lovingly towards you, even if I'm maybe not totally loving myself. But when I love, I love, I, I have, and this is another quality, I suppose, that I see my soulmate embody. And that is an aspect of love. And that's of equal value placed upon ourselves and others. We value each equally. And this means that, say, in the context of our relationship, my happiness is just as important to my mate as his happiness, and vice versa. And a lot of people in relationships feel like, well, only one of us can be happy, so who's going to make the compromise, or how are we both going to compromise so that we can have a little bit of happiness? And we have the philosophy that, that compromise never leads to happiness. We have to seek resolution and value each other equally. And I see this also in our day-to-day -day lives. When, when we can feel someone is doing something because they want to please us or they're uncomfortable with something but they're doing it anyway, uh, we say, please don't do that. You are as important as us. And if you're giving us special treatment or sacrificing some part of yourself in order to give us something, we don't want the thing. And we've actually given back donations that people have given to us because we feel like, hey, you need to love yourself. You know, there's no, um, there's no sacrifice in love. You don't need to sacrifice something for yourself in order to love us more. So this, this placing equal value upon everyone is very much what love does. But I just want to go back to this desire of self thing because it's really big. Um, uh, this desire of self is really about desiring our true nature, but also desiring to see those things within us that are injuries right now, and desiring to see how God sees us right now. And for me, AJ has had to go through a real lot to do that because of who we are. That's a really speaking on the other side of this in that I don't often desire my true self because of the fear that I have of how that will be received by others, uh, not just my real nature but actually my identity. And I suppose what I see reflected in AJ is this deep, deep level of humility to actually recognise that in order to love and in order to grow, he was going to have to desire himself, whoever that turned out to be. Um, and that's perhaps one of the most inspiring things that he has done that sort of takes my breath away. And, um, and all of you have to make a similar choice. It's just not quite as confronting as the one that we're making because you're not reincarnated. So that's good news, huh? <laughs> um, yeah, but it's a, it's a big deal. Anyway, does anyone have any questions? Because I feel like I'm blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Huh. I struggle with a spouse who does a lot of unloving things to himself. Um, he is very overweight, has every disease involved with being overweight, won't drink water, eats all kinds of meats, and I'm the opposite. And he's angry at me for being that way. And I don't know how to be, how do you be loving in that kind of situation? Do you just accept his choices and go not do anything? Well, I feel like I want to defer to my soulmate because I feel like he's better qualified at being loving. <laughs> when someone's harming themselves. But I feel that by... When you can see... You need to be careful, though. For, let's say the first thing. Sometimes it's really easy to see the way our partner is not loving themselves or others without first reflecting on how we're not loving ourselves and others. And when we do that and we point the finger of blame at our partner, 
um, often, and, and we're not looking at ourselves, often they can feel the injustice of that, which creates more resistance in them. So that's probably the first thing that I would look at if I was you. Hang on, am I looking as deeply as, at myself as I am at the problems that he's having? Because if I'm going to start uh, getting, like, talking to him about how he needs to do better to lo even just love himself, is he going to feel that there's a lot of hypocrisy in me because I'm not actually loving him or I'm not actually loving myself? When people don't love themselves and when they like abuse themselves with food and things like that, there's often really deep-seated pain inside of them. And if we are actually going to add to that burden by telling them that they're a bad person for doing that or they need to shape up, or if there's any kind of that emotion coming out of us, it's not going to actually be a loving exchange. It's going to be more harmful. So that's the first thing that I would look at. Beware of hypocrisy. <laughs> um, the second thing I think in principle, and I'm not speaking to your example here because I don't feel that sensitive to exactly what's happening there, but in principle, if you have a partner who's really damaging themselves and you're remaining in that situation, in a way you're complicit with them continuing to harm themselves or others. You know, if you have a partner who is acting out of harmony with love and you are not saying anything about it, after you've checked yourself for your own hypocrisy. But even, even if you're just willing to be shown your own hypocrisy, even if you're willing to just engage it and to hear back from them how you really are, um, to not say anything about it is actually being complicit in that problem. You're actually saying, it's okay, I'm, I'm just going to allow... You. Because love, love in action calls us to speak truth, you know, to say, hey, there's a problem here. And if we really love them, I value you. And you're not valuing you. Let's look at why. When I moved in with AJ, I, had, I, I was a terrible housekeeper. Ooh, I was so messy and I didn't want to look after our environment. And I, I would do it, but begrudgingly. And it was like, ugh. Um, and it had been a problem all my life. And especially from a certain period of my teens onwards. Um, and I'd received a lot of feedback about that in the past from parents or boyfriends or flatmates, but it was always very like, come on, you're causing discomfort for me, could you fix this problem? And it never, ever resolved. Now, I, it's quite different living in our house, isn't it? I take pride in our house, like, not pride in our house, but I, I like to keep it clean and tidy. I, I feel good about that. I, I take care of a lot of my personal care and the care of our home just naturally without thinking about it. But that change only happened in me because someone who was very loving came to me and said there was no blame within him. He wasn't saying, oh, this is, could you shape up because I don't want to live like this. There was a feeling of like... And literally, he would say to me, babe, come and sit down. I want to talk to you about something. There has to be something inside of you that means that you don't love yourself enough to do these things for yourself. Do you want to talk about that? Let's talk about what's going on for you, really, because I really care about you loving yourself. And that was incredibly powerful for me. It moved me to tears just that somebody actually cared that much about me, not for their own self selfish desires and needs, but because they really, really cared what was happening inside. Because I felt terrible about myself. I couldn't keep my house clean. You know, that I've had no self-esteem in me about that. And I'm sure your husband feels similarly in, about himself, you know. It's horrible to feel like you're failing at even maintaining your own body in a healthy state. Um, but it was only when someone was truly loving and compassionate with me that it actually spurred me into really wanting to heal that part of myself. And that's why I, I put the first caveat, which is check yourself for hypocrisy, check yourself for demands and, the sel and selfish desires within, within your desire for him to change, you know, because he'll feel that so strongly. I, I have to say I have been trying um, and, I, and I'm trying. He shuts down. Don't talk to me about this. I don't want to hear it. Yeah. Puts up the wall. Yeah. And I've, I've tried it from other angles, and it's wall. Yeah. So I would look strongly at yourself as well 
Um, and then if you feel like you have resolve within yourself, and I don't feel that you have yet, that you are coming from a really loving place, then I would be more firm about, I can't support you in this anymore. You know, I can't support you harming yourself because that, that I want... I want to foster you loving yourself, you know, and if I'm supporting you, I'm not fostering that. But did you want to add some... Yeah, I knew you would. Yeah. <laughs> Is that all right? <laughs> <laughs> um, you're not being very honest with yourself, Pamela. Um, there are lots of times where you want your husband to completely sacrifice himself for you. Right? So, in other words, what you're really projecting at him a lot of the times is... I want you to put yourself down and sacrifice yourself for my desires and my will. And then you're giving him this other mixed message. You should also look after yourself. <laughs> now, a person who has to put themselves down for you constantly, sooner or later is not going to feel good about themselves. Now, obviously, he's had this problem probably before he met you. Otherwise, he wouldn't tolerate that feeling coming from you either. Does that make sense? But that's the feeling coming from you towards him, that, that you, he's got to do everything you want him to do, plus look after himself. Now, the two things are actually not uh, harmonious with each other the way that you want them to be. The reason why is because you're causing him to tune away from himself while at the same time asking him to look after himself. Now, if you desire that in a relationship, it's like giving a person a completely mixed message from a soul-based perspective. So it's like me saying to Mary, I want you to do what I want. And, but on top of that, um, so to, to do that, Mary has to put herself down if she has to do everything I want. She has to somehow pull herself down, and particularly if my wants are quite selfish, she's going to have to put herself down to do everything I want. In putting herself down, she's not going to feel good about herself. She's not going to be doing the things that she really wants to do for her life. She's going to feel like she's got to be doing a heap of things for me. But in the end, if I then expect her to have good self-esteem afterwards, can you see I'm pulling down, I'm asking her to pull down her self-esteem when she's with me, but to have some self-esteem. It's a, it's a completely mixed message. Now, I see a lot of people in relationships doing this where, for example, the wife wants the husband to provide her security, her safety, her financial security, her, um, and a number of other... her sexual feeling like she's sexually desired, um, and a lot of other things. But to, to do that, he's got to pull himself down from his own desires in a lot of ways in order to do it. And then when he does that, and he gets a bit chubby, and, you know, he drinks a bit much because he's sad, you know, he doesn't feel the same thing coming from his wife, so he feels sad, so he drinks a bit much, and maybe takes up smoking, and, you know, drinks a bit much, and eats a bit much, you know, feeling bad about himself, and he gets a bit chubby, she says, you're not looking after yourself either. <laughs> it's like another demand placed upon him. And I suggest to you that um, he's not feeling from you your any real interest in him as an individual. He's only feeling from you what you want from him. That's all he's feeling from you. And when a, when a person, any person, man or woman, feels that from another, he, will, he or she will automatically go into resistance in the relationship. So in other words, they will purposefully then do what upsets you <laughs> because they know it's, it's a passive-aggressive way of disagreement with the other person's behaviour. And so I suggest that your husband is passively, aggressively disagreeing with your behaviour towards him. He's unwilling... He possibly can't even identify what he feels. Many, many, many times men can't. Um, but if you do what Mary said, look at yourself first and examine all the ways and all the expectations and all the demands you've had upon him, not only now, but also all the way through your relationship, right from the beginning of your relationship. And then you see also on top of that the demands that his own mother has placed upon him before you met him, right? Or other women have placed upon him before you met him. And you, you will see probably a history of demand upon, upon demand placed and, and then you'll see the reasons why he, in fact, is quite resistive. And then the first thing to do, as Mary pointed out, is firstly deal with all the demands coming out of you. Deal with that first. 
Once you no longer have any demands coming out of you, then my suggestion would be talk to him about what he must feel about your demands. Because obviously if he's in resistance like that to any discussion about the issue, then he's in some passive aggression. The fact that he's not overtly dumping it on you means that he's not aggressive, but the fact that he's causing annoyance to you through his behaviour of treatment of himself is a way of him trying to protest against prior behaviours while at the same time trying to maintain some kind of relationship. And, uh, and the better course of action for him would have been to protest more vigorously <laughs> earlier more in the open, relationship. Yeah. But if you examine your own feelings about that, you probably would have probably left him under those circumstances. And so, you know, he didn't feel that that was probably an option. And in fact, uh, what I see happening, there are many people who have heard divine truth who come to us and complain that their husbands or wives are not following the principles of divine truth in their life and how can they get their husband or wife to follow the principle of divine truth in their life. The way you get anybody to even listen to anything you've got to say is to love them. <laughs> and any time they don't want to listen to what you've got to say, it's highly likely there is something going on where you don't want or they're not feeling love from you. Now, that can be either that, that you have love for them and they don't feel it, or that you don't have any love for them and that's what they're feeling. Now, if you, if you think about what Mary's told you already about our relationship, no matter what happened, Mary still knew and could feel that I loved her. She always felt drawn to that place. You know? Yeah, I felt drawn because I could feel, even if I couldn't understand how this could be loving, I could feel there was this really kind feeling coming towards me and that was very compelling. I, I felt more accepted in this company than I did anywhere else. And there's more compassion. Mm. Like I always had compassion for both myself and for Mary, the equal compassion for both of us, right? And that's not what your husband's feeling from you. So, so any person generally who puts on a lot of weight, they are generally in quite strong anger but it's usually passive. In other words, it's not anger that they overtly are sharing with others, but anger that they are internalising. And as a result, weight will just stack on them and eventually they'll get very, very large if they're not careful. And usually that kind of anger, anger that you internalise, um, comes from what you believe is, and not always your beliefs are true, but what you believe is unfair treatment of yourself and uh, and that usually occurs over many many years where there is unfair treatment of yourself now eventually that anger will come and boil over so most people who have put on a lot of weight eventually gets to a point where they are quite overtly angry with everyone around them eventually but in before that stage they've had to internalize all of this stuff all of this anger and resentment that they've had and what needs to happen is the people around them as these people are putting on weight and as they're getting more and more unhealthy, the people around them have to start questioning how they are supporting this person in their own unhealthy treatment of themselves. And one of the biggest ways you support a person to do that is to demand things of them, emotionally demand things of them that they feel is unfair. Now, just because they feel it's unfair, it doesn't necessarily mean it is. But any demand, of course, is not loving. So, so naturally, they're not being loved under those circumstances. And if we look at those things first, then it allows us to work through a lot of these issues. Eventually, people who stack on a lot of weight and, and have those kind of things, eventually they will start being overt with their demands. Because after a while, they get so angry, they go, stuff this. <laughs> right? I'm not putting up with this anymore. You try and tell me another thing about myself, that's it. I don't want to know. Don't talk to me about it anymore. And, and even that is also still really passive because they could be just yelling and screaming at you by that stage, but they're not. And so what I suggest is that the first thing we need to do is look at all the reasons why we do that. Now, a person who feeds themselves too much and drinks too much obviously doesn't love themselves. So the core problem, the real core problem from a grief perspective is going to be a lack of love of self. 
the question we need to ask ourselves is how have we contributed to their lack of love of self? That's the question. That's the thing we can change. And I notice that even with children, very frequently uh, parents contribute to the lack of love inside of the children for themselves and so the child feels so little love for themselves and their room becomes untidy and everything else becomes you know messy and then the parents nagging them about being messy and untidy and whatever else but but a lot of it began from their lack of love of themselves does that make sense the and parents the pa- and the parents and the parents that, contribution yeah, yeah. to their lack of love of themselves which is all about the parents demands the parents controls and so forth and so we need to be very when we notice somebody not loving themselves we need to be very self reflective about how we have contributed to that now in my case with mary we met 6 years ago and i noticed firstly mary's own lack of love of herself and obviously i didn't create it because i hadn't lived with her before then but when we've lived with somebody for 10 15 20 30 years we are a part of the creation of their own lack of love for themselves their current position and we need to examine why or how that's happened Does that make sense so that's i feel what you're skipping over you sort of um, you're not allowing yourself to see how your demands upon the relationship and upon him emotional demands primarily over a long period of time and the demands of his mother in particular as well before then and have contributed to his own lack of love of himself and now you're just annoyed that he doesn't love himself does that make sense and you want him to fix it and you're just annoyed with him that he doesn't love himself and you can see the problems it's going to cause in the future obviously you know if he becomes more and more unhealthy there's more that you're going to have to do to look after him and in a way that's part of his passive aggressive anger expression of what's happened in the past yeah the more you have to do he can get away with being sick and you have to do more does that make sense and uh, and it is a way of actually cre- creating this sort of demand with people Interestingly, there are many diseases on the planet that are caused by almost exactly the same emotion. Cancer is one of them. So cancer is a disease that is caused by this feeling of other people's a uh, feeling that other people should meet your demands, right? And a feeling that you don't want to look after your own emotional needs and you want other people to look after your own emotional needs and it, and where you get the cancer will depend exactly on where you feel these particular emotions so for for a woman getting cancer in her left, bre- left breast it's all about her feelings that women should meet her demands right for a woman getting cancer in her right breast it's all about men meeting her demands right and uh, and and often these kind of diseases get created the passive aggressive rage that we internalize and then of course our own body starts having damage attributed to it due to the passive aggressive rage which is an unloving position so what's happening to your husband now of course is he's putting on weight he's you know potential for disease and potential for diabetes you know the potential for a number of different diseases and these things are part of his now his own way of addressing a long term issue where he feels he's been treated unfairly for a long period of time by women in particular as that makes sense um so he will have to deal with that at some point if he ever wants to be healthy um and he ever wants to have a healthy relationship but but the key for you is to see where you've contributed to that through your demands does that make sense yeah and i feel that's the thing you're skipping over you you want it to be uh, and we often do this in relationships we want it to be the other person's problem all the time right? <laughs> yeah, he's getting fat it must be his fault <laughs> Well, he's, it's his body, so it's got to be his fault, right? That's what we think, but we don't see, we don't go, okay, that's caused by somebody who's either eating, drinking too much, it's caused by somebody who obviously um, doesn't have a good sense of self-worth, and if, that, if they don't have a good self, sense of self-worth, then you've got to say, well, okay, it's okay, they don't have a good sense of self-worth, but who's lived with them for the majority of their life? <laughs> and who would have assisted their creation of their lack of self-worth so obviously firstly their parents would have but then if we've lived with them for 30 years we we can't say to ourselves that we haven't been a part of the creation of it 
because obviously we have. You know, if we've just met them for the first time, it's different. But if we've been with them for a long period of time, then we're a part of the creation. Yeah. That make sense? Thank you. That light bulb went off in my head. That was great. Thank yeah. You. If you allow yourself, you will see a lot of the long-term demands you've had upon him emotionally where he's felt like he's had to do a certain things in order to please you. And if you look at his mum, whom you don't necessarily have a good relationship with yourself, uh, mostly because you're very similar <laughs> in the sense of his, your demands upon your husband. And, uh, and, therefore, uh, and this is what happens with a lot of fighting between mother-in-laws and daughter-in-laws as well, or a lot of um, what I'd call, not fighting, but... You know, not Not... They're not open and free with each other and not loving with each other. And a lot of it is because both mother and, and daughter-in-law have the same demands upon the same person. And so the man, you know, in this case, has grown up with those demands. Then he, of course, through his law of attraction, marries a person with those same demands. And then, um, and then more demands is placed upon him. Eventually, if he, you know, understood all of that, he would start realising he's just got to deal with some stuff about his mum and so forth and he'd release a lot of stuff and that would help him have some good self-esteem and help him feel better about himself. And But it, to be frank, he won't put up with as much as your shit either <laughs> if he does that. And, uh, and you won't like that very much because you've liked him doing what his mum has liked him doing, even though it's been damaging to him. Does that make sense? So the key is to be self-reflective and allow yourself to feel about that and allow yourself to see that and change it in yourself. Change your demands coming out of you. Truly change them, not, not through your action, but through your emotion by, by re letting go of the emotions that drive those demands. And he will feel that from you. And he'll feel then drawn, just like Mary has felt drawn, back all the time to have more conversation about things. Uh, he'll, she'll, he'll feel drawn to openly converse with you about what he's really feeling and why and things like that. At the moment, he doesn't feel drawn to do that because he knows as soon as he says what he really feels, you're going to not believe him. You, you're going to say, no, that's not the way it is. And, you know, he knows that, so, so he shuts it all down and just says, I don't want to hear anymore. Don't talk to me about that divine truth crap anymore. I don't want to hear. <laughs> don't talk to me about emotional stuff anymore. I don't want to hear. And, uh, and that's as a result of him now ha having what he feels is the only protection from these demands. Yeah. How many of you ladies have had similar situation in your marriages and now that you reflect? A few of you, yeah. yeah. And a lot of men have the same thing towards their wives, of course. Like mm -hmm. I'm not saying that it's gender related, it's definitely... You know, it can be intergender related. Like I see a lot. You know, we go to countries like, um, you know, where, where you countries where ma males are more still more dominant than females. And man, the the guys have got huge demands going at their wives. You know, we recently had something to do with places in Africa, and the guys have just got huge demands going towards their wives. And their wives are now angry, resentful, chubby <laughs> um, people in passive-aggressive rage, you know, and in the case of one place in Africa, the guys are all just sitting around chatting to each other all day. None of them have jobs. They don't do any work around the house or anything else, and they, and they have the woman cook for them, clean for them, go and get the food for them, go and get the water for them, and, and you know, when you point out to them their unloving behaviour, what they say? They say, oh, but all my mates will, uh, will look down on me if I do all that. That's a woman's work, right? So, you know, so it's not, it's not just one gender over another that has demands on the other gender. It's mm. it, worldwide, there's a big problem with it. Yeah. 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 Mm. Anyway, thanks. So, Boris, you wanted to ask something? Every question is very confronting for me. <laughs> just trying to see what... Um, I have a question about desire of self. Um, I uh, have a sh I really want to um, get to a point where I'm very honest uh, regardless of the situation and I'm very jealous of, of people who are like yourself for instance um, who, who can speak from the heart um, 
and uh, not, af not afraid of how it will come out because I have a lot of fear of, of being unloving in the, in, the, in the process of being honest. Yeah. And that's kind of like the block that I have. Um, probably together with uh, a lot of slow self-work and, and other things. But my question is like, how, like what would be a, a way to get past that to actually just be open and, and not be af afraid? And what do you reckon, Boris? Because I reckon you're pretty cluey about these things. How do you think you get from a place of like living in the fear of if I'm honest, it might be unloving and I'm not going to be really, really honest all the time because it might be unloving. So I'm going to suppress this part of me to a place where you're like AJ, just open hearted, truthful, down the line, love accompanies at every time. Well, I, I imagine that if, like just go with it. And then once I go through, just if I'm unloving, just feel about that. Um, it's, it requires humility on yeah. your part. So um, what did you say earlier, babe? You, you need to be in situations where the fear is confronted and feel during those times. And feel before you go to speak, obviously. Because if, you, if you're a self-aware, humble person, you'll feel if, am I saying this to control something that's going on? Or I'm saying this because it's an expression of myself. Like, what's my motivation for speaking? And if you find unlovingness in it, well, then you know, okay, I've got to look at that and heal that before I take an action. But you're not always going to know, because like there's a lot of fear surrounding it. So the challenge is to be yourself more honestly. But always, you're going to say something. I can feel it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I might as well do it. Um, <laughs> I don't desire myself more than I desire God's truth. So the, the, the feeling I have about God's truth is that is of, of supreme importance to me. And I feel that it needs to be of supreme importance to everybody um, if they ever want to experience real happiness and also work through any issue. So I honour God's truth above my own feelings. Does that make sense? So what that means is when I'm placed in a situation where I feel something, the first question I ask myself is, but what does God feel about this? So my feelings might be such and such. So for example, let's say Mary, um, in one part of our relationship, like she mentioned, she left and then she started to date this other guy. Right? So this was right back in the beginning, six years ago. And, and what are my feelings about that? Oh, I think that's terrible. Like, I wanted to be with her, she wasn't with me. Um, any of those things occurring. And it's not your earrings, so there's something. I don't something think so. so yeah. um, and, uh, and so I felt that was terrible. But what's God's truth about that? Well, God's truth is that she has free will. She's allowed to choose to leave me at any time and be with somebody else if, if she wants to be. Now, she just dated the guy. But she could have chosen to live with him, have children with him, and all those kind of things. And that, she, that would have been her expression of her will. And she's allowed to do that. And, and if I get angry with her about that, or even try to correct her from doing that, when I know that she wants to do that, I would be out of harmony. Does that make sense? To even mention it to her. So... If Mary asked me, what do I feel about that? I'd say, well, yeah, I feel pretty sad about that, you know. And I do, did have to feel a lot of sadness. I actually, well, I actually cried for nearly 16, well, it was about, it was probably close to, I don't know, six weeks for about eight hours a day about that. Right, so it was a fair, a lot of processing that I did about that. And, uh, and you know, I was, pretty, I was pretty sad about that. But once I worked through that sadness and come out the other end, I realised a lot of my sadness wasn't actually about Mary's choice. It was about my own lack of worth and my belief that her choice was because of me. Does that make sense? And once I worked through that emotion, which took me about three days, <laughs> and two days later, a day later, I thought, Mary's going to call me pretty soon. And sure enough, two days later, she gives me a call. And she says, oh, I would like to see you again and whatever, you know, like. And, 
And, and I realised that actually, again, all that did was help me expose an emotion in me where I felt a certain thing, that, which was about myself really, well, not, not so much about Mary. It was really about myself because if, if I was really secure in myself, I would not have cried for six weeks about Mary going and being with somebody else. I would have just thought, Mary, you're crazy, I'm a good person. <laughs> if I was really happy with myself, I'd say, you're crazy, you're good, uh, you know, I'm a good person and, 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 I know, and I'm the other half of you too. You know, that's, <laughs> but, and I, but I wouldn't have felt any insecurity at that, right? So, and that's what I realised coming out of all of that. that so, so, but what I'm saying is I had to ask myself, what is God's truth? God's, the, what helped me the most was, what is God's truth? God's truth is, she's allowed to choose to do whatever she wants. That's God's truth. And if I'm upset about it, I'm out of harmony with God's truth. So if she, if she wants to go and be with somebody else, I'm out of harmony with God's truth if I'm upset about it. And then I know, okay, all I've got to do is find out where out of harmony with God's truth I am, feel about that, and then that'll be gone, and then I'll be okay with her being with somebody else, if that's what she wants to do. I will honour that. Even though I still desire to be with her and want to be with her, and I don't want to be with anyone else, I would still do, I would desire her to follow her will. So this is where you've got to balance the desire for yourself with what, what is important. more important than that is your desire for God's truth, which Mary wrote on the previous page, if you remember. And, and also, probably just within that, Boris, when I say desire of self, what I see is that AJ wants to experience himself, all of himself. Now, that doesn't necessarily involve talking to anyone. So be careful about... Remember when I was talking about the lunch? He just sat there and had the lunch and talked about other so I things. I sat there getting abused emotionally and, and verbally, probably for five hours. Um, it w yeah. didn't worry me. Because yeah. <laughs> I, I know what I am. I know who I am. I know what I am. I know uh, how I feel about myself. I know, I know that the guy even doing it has no idea of who I am. Like, and he has no idea of what love he was receiving from me during that entire time. But there was no feeling of pressure or need for AJ to point that out to him either because he's busy experiencing himself. And the, the attraction wasn't that anyone was... When people asked a question, he'd attempt to answer and then they'd talk over him. And so then he just, OK, you don't want to know. He honoured free will in that situation. So they're telling me, bombarding me with all these beliefs they have about me and... And about life and, and about God. about life and, and God and everything. And they'd ask me a question, I'd start answering, and then, then they just talk over that. And, and I'd say, oh, fair enough, they don't want to know, that's okay. I'm okay, I, I had a good meal. They did, I, they did. They prepared, a, a, they demonstrated some love to us because they prepared a meal where there was some vegan, vegan and vegetarian options, and uh, knowing that we'd be coming. And that was, to me, that was enough. We had a good meal. and. And I managed to, oh, yeah, one of the other fellows gave me a gift of a few plants to plant. Uh, so at the end of the day, <laughs> um, I was quite happy coming away from it. I said to Mary, I don't know if I'd uh, want to go back there regularly. <laughs> but the, but the, the guy who did most of it, I actually enjoyed his company, as Mary said, a lot. Because he was the least fake. He was the most real of everyone. That's, like, that's what I wanted to get to is to be real, least fake and be honest and open regardless of it. Yeah, yeah. This is why, like, like with Ted, like, I love Ted because he is not fake with me. Yeah. Ted's, if you put your hand up, Ted's so you use <laughs> Ted's real. Yeah. He's not fake with me. He tells me exactly what he feels. Every, I know exactly what he feels. What I get from him emotionally is exactly what I get from him with his words. Exactly the same. So I love that. That's what I'm afraid of, is if I do that, then I'll be unloving to the people I talk to. Yeah, I don't feel Ted's unloving. I feel that's him expressing himself, and some of his opinions, in my opinion, are incorrect, and I'm sure he feels the same that some of my opinions are incorrect, <laughs> and, but, I, but I can feel his realness. And when you can feel a, the realness of an individual, um, they are already being more loving to themselves and more loving to you. They are presenting themselves as they truthfully are. And can you see, Boris, when you're feeling something but you're not being it, 
So let's, let's leave out speaking here because, you know, sometimes people feel like, oh, I've got to speak it. And that's not necessarily loving either. No. But you, you're saying you want, to, you want to be on the outside who you are on the inside. Now... So be it. That's awesome. <laughs> that's going to help so much because you'll be confronted daily. It's like me with AJ. Before I met him, I had a big, good tap dance of a facade going on. And then I met him and I was like, whoa, I can't maintain it anymore. I'm just pissed off, you know. And that actually was growth for me. And I thought it was the opposite. But actually, when we are carrying stuff inside of us that's unloving and trying to cover it over, people feel it anyway. They feel like you're not real. They feel all these things. And actually, it's gross to just be real. And especially if you don't justify how you are. If you just be who you are and don't go, yeah, and I should be, just be who you are and then go, oh, what's God showing me about that? You'll grow so much more quickly. Now, some people we meet... uh they are who they are, but they are also unwilling to look at any truth from God's perspective. Now, that, of course, is a recipe for arrogance and disaster <laughs> in the relationship with God in particular. So, so you're not like that. So allow yourself to be who you are, but also be self-reflective, as Mary pointed out earlier as well. Allow yourself to see yourself, notice when... Observe what observe you're attracting, what you're look at yourself, take responsibility... Often I have a self-judgment of that I'm being fake and I'm, and I'm judging myself for it. I'm yeah. like beating myself up about it. So I'm beating myself up about it. Yep. You know, that's... Yeah, and you don't need to beat yourself up about it. Look, when I was sitting in this situation that Mary described, I'm sitting there going, yeah, I've attracted this man who basically is just basically condescending to me the entire time. And I liked him because he was honest about it, the rest of the people there were all condescending towards me and I could feel the same emotions coming from them, but they didn't, they didn't have the courage even to say that, whereas this guy did, you know, he was just way out there <laughs> saying exactly <laughs> and what he And to thought. his credit also, as you pointed out later, at one point I said to him, look, you keep asking questions and you're not letting him answer, you know, and he took pause. He's the only one who took pause. He said, yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. And then he didn't answer. <laughs> to but, you know, at least he even saw that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And whereas, whereas I feel that uh, the majority of people cover even that over, they don't really say what they're feeling. Now, if he had of um, allowed himself to be more, more self-reflective, he would have learned a lot through that exchange. But for me, I had to sit there and go, OK, I've again attracted an arrogant man being condescending with me. Okay, this is telling me something about what's still a hole inside of me. There's a feeling that he has that he can just sit there for five hours and no, 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 at me, be condescending the entire time and should be able to get away with it. That's what he feels. Now, there's nothing I can do, short of trying to get up and punch him in the nose, to stop him from doing that. <laughs> so, so I can sit there and allow him to do that, but I've got to reflect too. It's my soul allowing that as well. So I had, to, I had to, and I've started looking at this injury I have with some of these men where I just allow these men to, you know, condescend to me constantly. And many of them are not just condescending, they're overtly angry and belittling and so forth. And, and I had to, I've had to work through what am I feeling about that? And, uh, and, and I'm still working through some of those feelings. So if you're self-reflective, you can do that. You know, you can go, okay, this is something I've attracted and I need to address this issue. Of course, he had the opportunity to see his own arrogance and, and, and really, in the end, stupidity as well, but he didn't choose to, but that's his choice. I can't change him. He can only change him. I can't, there's nothing I could say that will make him feel like differently if he wants to do what he wants to do. Does that make sense? So from one, one uh, side, I would have to feel about the fact that uh, I'm being condescended upon. Yes. And, and then um, I think that the, the other side is finding the courage to uh, express the fact that, bring it to his attention. Well, you don't even have to do that. It's your soul that's creating the opening that the other person believes they can exploit. If your soul, your feelings weren't creating the opening, he wouldn't feel like he could get away with it with you. Does he would sense? begin and he would feel, there would be more feedback to him to feel, oh, this, maybe this isn't right. Because there's a soul there saying, hey, that's not loving. 
Whereas when we accept those things, or when we have a hole inside of ourselves, it's like there's no impediment really to that expression. It's sort of like when our soul is open to somebody expressing themselves in a certain way towards us, what we're really doing before we even open our mouth and before they open theirs, we're giving them the feeling that it's okay. The feeling coming from our soul is it's okay to treat me condescendingly. And that usually comes from the feeling inside of you that you're worth less than they are. Does that make sense? There's a feeling inside of you that you're worth less than they are and so there's an openness to, for, the, for somebody to exploit that feeling inside of you. Now, their willingness to exploit the feeling is an expression of their own lack of love. Because if a person truly loved, they would not be willing to exploit it. So, so if I feel, let's say I can feel inside of you a, a feeling, of, um, feeling of lack of worth in terms of internal self-worth. If I loved you, I wouldn't want to exploit it. I wouldn't want to manipulate it. I wouldn't want to make you feel worse about yourself. But if I don't love you... I might want to exploit it, manipulate it, get you to do what I want, and on top of that, make you feel bad doing it. <laughs> and I might want to put you down, and, and this is all my lack of love that causes me to do those things. Now, our soul opens a certain way, and that causes the other person's injuries to either be heightened or be suppressed in some way. And, and for the majority of people, the injury is heightened, and they don't use their will to love, and so they act out their heightened sense of ability to exploit your weakness. And, and so once you patch up the weakness, or if you like, inside of your own soul on that matter, you'll find you'll have less people exploiting it, and when people try to exploit it, it won't hurt. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so you won't feel angry about it or sad about it or, you know, afraid of it or any of those things. It won't hurt at all once you've patched up the hole. If it hurts, then it tells you the hole's not patched up yet. Yeah. So sometimes for me still, my men's condescension towards me hurts. So I know I have not patched up the feeling that I have as a result. And that's why they like doing it. They like doing it because they know it hurts. Does that make sense? But that's their injury. Hurt, trying to hurt somebody is not a very nice injury. It, depend, it demonstrates a very dark condition. But that's their injury. I can't change their injury. All I can do is change my hurt. Thank you. Okay. Questions here? Yeah. If we go here. Oops, that was me. Sorry. I pumped it. Hello. Uh, my name is Eugene. Um, thank you so much. You guys have been wonderful um, talking about real practical pieces on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I do um, a lot of work with a variety of people, um, body work and yep. things, and um, one of the things I keep hearing is, you know, just feel it or some real sort of... It's, uh, I, what I guess when I'm, my question is, getting a little bit more clarity on the process of actually processing the feelings through our bodies on a daily basis, you know, 16 days of crying or, I mean, these, these are long processes, years of processing these feelings from, and I feel like I'm coming out of the fog of like, okay, what technique do I use now on whatever given day or whatever given condition of the stars, uh, you know, there's so many, <laughs> so many fa factors, and so, uh, you, you know, uh, truth and love and desire, pure desire, and yeah. yep. uh, even, even the sense of purity, how do I get there, or how do I know, or how, you know, the, the clarity of knowing, so uh, if you could maybe break down a few practical things for us mere mortals. Sure. Um, <laughs> well, we are very we near are mere mortals. Yeah. Mortals. Um, f first thing for yourself, you want, oh. Eugene. I feel um, you might want to keep some of that on there. I don't know. That's all right. Yeah. But the, f the first thing that's important to understand is that a child doesn't do all of these intellectual gymnastics. There's no techniques. There's no techniques that a child uses to feel its emotions. There's two types of emotions a child has generally. Rebellion 
and acceptance of its own emotions. So in other words, a child will do one of two things, rebel against its own emotions or accept completely its own emotions. Really, in some ways, we're all children like that still. But we've just chosen... We just have a lot of other ways of rebelling. You know, we've learnt to rebel by just being slimy about it or we've learnt to rebel by, by you know, telling ourselves a different story. Or we've distracting learnt, we're ourselves. Distracting ourselves or eating. Making or a higher choice. Drinking uh, or yeah. some other method to rebel, right? The child doesn't do that with rebellion either. The child just rebels. So if you look at a child where where a child doesn't get what it wants and has an addiction to get it. So let's say you take it through a shop and it wants a candy. What does a child do? And if you don't give it? Tantrum. 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 That's the rebellion, right? There's the rebellion. And it doesn't cover the rebellion with a nice, pretty facade. <laughs> it doesn't, it, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, go, oh, mummy, uh, you know, manipulate the situation to get the... Although after a while it does learn these things, of course. But initially it's just full out, full on rebellion. Well, we're all really most of the time rebelling, but we've learnt to control all our rebellion using different techniques. So that's one thing a child does. The other thing a child does on the other side is acceptance. So once rebellion is restricted in the child, the child goes from... I don't know, I think it's I me what's... somehow. I don't know what's causing this, but... It's just getting worse, isn't it? It was pretty good this morning, wasn't it? Yeah, it's been it? pretty good this morning. Let me just take my earrings off to see if that's It's not your, your... Your earrings were hitting, but yeah. it's not that chunk thing. It's a... RF thing. But acceptance. the other part is acceptance. Let's look at acceptance. What does the child do when it accepts? It goes from rebellion to acceptance. When it goes into acceptance, what does it do? It just starts crying and it just sobs a bit. Ten minutes later, it's happy as Larry. <laughs> you know, it's like it's over the situation. And, and in fact, oftentimes after it's had a cry like that and now happy, it's also a lovely pleasant person to be with after that. I don't know if you've noticed that. But what happens is that we teach the child, and, and this is how we have been taught, to wrap up our rebellion with wrappers, to make it more politically, shall we call it, or socially acceptable to everyone around us. So we wrap up the rebellion. We put facade on the rebellion. We make out that we're happy when we're not happy. We make out that we're not upset when we really are upset. We make out that we, you know, are loving when really we have a lot of pretty dark emotions projected at others. So what we've got to do is deconstruct the wrappers around rebellion and our all addictions and anger that are caused when we don't get our addictions met and deconstruct the actual rebellion itself. In other words, just like we would with a child, we need to restrict our own rebellion. So that's the next step. So the way we restrict our own rebellion, if it was a child, this is what I would do. If Mary was in rebellion as a child, I'd be like this, like this, and I'd just hold her. She can't do anything, right? And she might try, right? But the more she tries, the more she'll feel her own rebellion. You follow me? So with a little child, you can do that. But with an adult your size, you can't do that, right? <laughs> you get bopped in the nose. All sorts of things could happen there. So, so we have to learn to restrict our own rebellion. And by that, what I mean is we need to allow ourselves to go into the rebellion, right? Feel the rebellion. But understand that the rebellion is the avoidance of the deeper emotion, the accepting emotion. And the accepting emotion, most of the time, is fear or grief. In other words, we're afraid of something or we just need to cry about something. So the secret to addressing these emotions, when you say just feel it, what, what we really mean is we need to feel our rebellion, the anger and other emotions, but also restrict it in the sense that we don't dump it on everybody around us and you know, cause don't all sorts of havoc. Punish our environment. Punish our it? environment yeah. in any way. And we need to understand that we're not accepting when we're in rebellion, that we're not accepting the real emotion when we're in rebellion. And ask ourselves, the next step is to ask ourselves what is the real emotion that we're rebelling against. 
And like I said, it has to be related to fear or grief. So it's always going to be related to fear or grief. What is the real emotion that I'm rebelling? Now, once you get into the real emotion, you will become a pleasant person. <laughs> Because and it will be automatic. That's all this release we're talking about and the healing that happens is when you simply allow that emotion rather than rebelling against it or suppressing it. Yep. Uh, then you, like the little kid who's had the big cry. Have a good cry. All soft and, and loose-limbed and pleasant to be and around. And loving yep. to be with, right? Now, what we notice happening a lot is people are trying to guess what the real emotion is and accept what they guess. The problem with trying to guess an emotion and then accept what you've guessed is that you won't have the subsequent result at the end, which is you'll be peaceful, calm, and, you know, have a good cry and actually then feel like you're a more loving person. You won't have that result. So we often hear people saying, oh, yes, I processed for three hours the other day about this motion, and we're looking at them going, I'm sorry, but you're not a more loving person than you were <laughs> before that process. So that tells me that the whole thing was fake. And why would I want to create a fake existence or a fake experience? Because I'm avoiding the real one. That's the only reason why we want to create a fake one. So, so a child doesn't do that. A child doesn't create a facade-based fake experience except when it's been taught to do so. A, a normal child, you restrict their rebellion, they'll go into acceptance of the real emotion, they'll experience that emotion, and the end result is the proof whether it was true or not. The end result being peace and a more loving person. That's the end result. Now, if you don't feel those feelings inside of you after processing through an emotion, then you haven't processed through the right one. You've just tried to choose one rather than feel what's really there. Does that make sense? So, so that would be the process. Now, once you get to the fear, it's going to be a bodily experience. When a child goes into fear, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but if... A, you know, if you've ever dealt with children that have come from abusive families or whatever, you can see fairly easily what, what they do with fear. If they truly get into their fear, they shake, they, feel, they have what you would classify as post-traumatic stress most of the time. They shake, they have all sorts of emotions come up, they're crying, shaking. They're sweating. Sweat, you know, have all sorts of these physiological responses. So that's the fear. And then with grief, it's just a simple matter of sobbing. Not angry crying, but sobbing. When I say angry crying, you know the difference between an angry cry and a sob? An angry cry is uh, I'm not getting what rebellion I want. against the yeah. world for what you have to go through. The sob is complete acceptance of the sadness that's within. Right? When, a, when a child goes into that, you know it's in the real emotion, and that's the healing emotion that creates the peace and the more love afterwards. So... That's what we need to allow ourselves to do. Right? Now, we naturally were created by God to do these things. As proof of that, look at a child. A child does it automatically. The only reason why we don't naturally do it as an adult is because we have taught ourselves to place wrappers around all of this stuff. In other words, we've created the facade person. So there's three selves, as we've discussed. There's the real self God created. There's the self that's been injured by life experiences. And then there's the self we created to avoid the injury. The facade. The facade. That we're talking about. Yeah. The facade self. Now, we have created the facade self in order to avoid the painful process of going through our injured self. And once we go through, once we understand how a child does that, what we need to do is allow ourselves to do the same thing. Now, there is no secret to that. There's no special waiting for a certain time of the month or a certain time of the year or a certain... Or you know, technique or... There's no special techniques. There are many things that can help us, but if you have your will firmly set to avoid your pained self, nothing, no technique will work. Not a single technique will work. And if you're really good with your facade self, really good at maintaining it, there is not a single technique that will work to help you get to your pained self, the injured self. The only way we can truly get to our injured self is to have a feeling inside of ourselves that we want to get to our real self, our injured self that's present, and eventually to the real self that God created. And... To do that requires a lot of diligent effort in self-reflection. 
a deep level of self-honesty. And for me, you know, I've been talking about my story today. Six years ago, I, I did not have a desire to see that injured self. I didn't want even my real self. I didn't want it. And even though I thought it was a good idea, I didn't want it. And I had to get to a place where I really felt I don't want it. And to feel that, to be deeply honest about what I wanted instead and, and to work through those things in this same way, just with deep honesty, acceptance of what was there and allowance of what was there without trying to manage a facade or manage anything. Um, and what that looked like... Yeah. externally watching Mary doing that, <laughs> what that looked like was she'd feel the anger of having to even feel anything about her injured self and she'd go out and bash the hell out of a baseball, <laughs> you know, a boxing bag with a baseball bat, yelling and screaming and swearing. And eventually she got beyond that rage, the rebellion, and into some of the accepting emotions. Does that make sense? But she had to allow herself to go through that process. Now, before we met, you didn't even think you had any of that rage, did you? No, didn't. my addictions were happily being met and, or, you know, but I wasn't a very happy person. Uh, but I didn't even want to be aware of that. I was just very focused on taking actions um, and trying to live a life that I thought was good, uh, but I didn't experience happiness. I wasn't comfortable socially. The thought of doing something like this, I couldn't have done it, you know, and to be very honest about what was inside of me, I'd never done it before in my life. And th and here's a person telling me what's inside of me, and I didn't, I didn't want anyone to know any of that stuff, and he could see it in a heartbeat, and so there was a lot of... a lot of times of... Mary wouldn't even agree, and I didn't expect her to agree either. Yeah. yeah, it took me a long time sometimes to really, like the email thing... Yeah, no, no, and then I'd walk away and I'd go, he's right, you know, like, uh, about what, what's inside of me, you know, but it took me a long time to really value that even, yeah. 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 So there's basically the steps are, see, every time that you're operating without, not like a child would operate, understand there is a facade going on somewhere. A child will either go into rebellion or into acceptance of an emotion. Now, obviously, in the end, we can choose acceptance all the time of an emotion. And, and whatever that emotion is, if it's grief, we'll cry. If it's, you know, deep sorrow, then we'll sob. If, it, if it's, um, you know, shame, we'll feel sh our shame as hot flushes coming over us, feeling our shame and so forth. Whatever the emotion is, we will naturally feel if we are accepting of the emotion. If that's not happening then it's because we're in rebellion. And what we need to do is feel our rebellion. We need to feel just like a child would, you know, let the child, when it's let on the ground, you know, put your foot on it, let it on the ground, <laughs> but let on the ground, just kicking and screaming, having a good scream. It doesn't care about what, you know, what's pretty. It doesn't care about how everybody else thinks of it or whatever else. It just, and it doesn't direct its rage towards other people in that state either. It just goes into this rebellion against the universe <laughs> on the floor without even harming another person. Now that's, they are some of the emotions that we have within us too, the same kind of emotion. And we need to allow this childlike expression of emotion um, to the point where we are comfortable with the fact that we can do that. As we release more and more emotions, there will be less and less childlike expressions of negative Rebellion. emotion. Yeah. As we uh, accept more of our emotion, there will be more and more childlike expressions of our loving emotions. So in other words, we'll express our love, we'll express our happiness, our joy, with more childlike spontaneity as well, as a result. So we don't, But we don't have to try to do it that way. We just need to choose whether we're going to go into the rebellion emotion that's there or if that's not there are we going to accept the accept the emotion we need to accept in order to grow and the measurement of growth is am i peaceful and more loving afterwards that's the only measurement you need to worry about you know it sounds sounds simple yeah it is simple <laughs> it's so simple not necessarily but it can be easy. hard right yeah <laughs> can be hard yeah because Thanks. there's so much negative viewpoints about what I've just said in the world that we live in. 
a lot of the stuff for me has been just judgments of how will people view me when, when I'm angry? How will people view me when they see me afraid? How will people view me when they see me emotional about anything? Uh, a lot of those things constitute huge blocks for me. How is the world going to perceive this real emotional me? Yeah. So a lot of the early work has been working through those very things before I'd even feel anything. And that's uh, about ex exercising your desire to get there in the end, you know, and to be patient with yourself. You know, we have, like I said, layer upon layer of wrappers, and you've got to be patient with yourself. Now, one of your things you do is body work, right, or, or massage and other types of body work. And, and this is a very good way to actually assist people to express, connect with the body and express what they really feel. You know that in certain parts of the body, when you, you know, hit certain parts of the body, they have certain emotional expressions. Now, the majority of people I find when you connect with certain parts of the body go, don't touch there, too hard it hurts. Right? <laughs> but if you keep doing that, a, an emotion will come up of some kind and you allow them to express that emotion. You don't even have to talk to them about it. If you have a feeling inside of you that they're allowed to do that, Whatever is triggered gets triggered, and eventually you'll notice they'll either go into one of those two childlike states, the rebellion state or the acceptance state. Now, if they choose the rebellion state, it's because they're using their free will to choose the rebellion state. Not much you can do about that. You say, oh, we just chose the rebellion state. That's fine. <laughs> you know. But the accepting state would be better if you chose that. And, and keep pressing, keep pressing until they either ask you to stop or, or they go into the accepting state. And the, sa the same applies when you're he so helping a person with any uh, modality of trying to heal them. All you need to do is help them get out of the rebellion state and into the accepting state. That's the only... Uh, without task. pushing them. You know, you're allowing them, if they want rebellion, yeah. allow rebellion until they've exhausted themselves like the kid having the tantrum. <laughs> yeah, but as you probably do know, um, the average person who comes along to get any type of healing generally wants you to fix them. They don't want to understand what caused their problem. And one of the things they are going to need to understand at some point in their future is what causes their problems. Yeah, it's a process. They, you know, you kind of meet them where they're... Where, where they're, they're at. Going. Yeah. Yeah, and then try to help them get beyond that point <laughs> <laughs> at some point, yeah. 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 Thank you. No worries. Cheers. Okay, right. yeah, if we go here. to Mike. Yep. How's the time, everyone? 10, Ten to four. Yeah, okay. Hey, um, so I have this personality conflict where I have a bit of me that's like very much an empath. Very much on. It, like an empath, you know, like... Um, you feel things very yeah, sensitively? Yeah, I feel, right? yeah, I like to, um, I guess I have a sense of compassion, but I'm confused about it, I guess, uh, and I'll try and explain. Um, like I love commiserating with people, you know, I love hearing what they're about, you know, their story and... Yeah. Um, but um, it's going to be hard to explain. I have that part of me, and I think that, that I love that quality in me, but at the same time, um, I'm also uh, artistic, uh, which has a tendency of, you know, I like to express myself. Um, uh, I'm a musician. I'm a, a designer, an artist. Yeah. So there's a sense of, like, wanting to be myself, you know, and I love that part of me, but I'm also, I also have this part of me that, you know, loves to hear and uh, other people's stories and, and also feeling what they're feeling as well. Mm -hmm. So I feel like a lot of times I have this um, conflict between the two. Um, and it's very difficult because I feel like, um, and it's interesting what you were first referring to in the beginning, which was the stories we've been told about what love is and then the reality of it, you know? Like, I feel like I've been told that story in the beginning um, with my childhood and my family and the way that they express love and, you know, I believe that they're very well intentioned, but I've always had a rebellion um, because there was something that I think that I felt about what you're talking about. Somehow, inherently, I felt like that was the right way, but I didn't know how to articulate it. So I've always kind of been fighting those two. Um, anyway, I feel like it's been damaging to me, you know, like I want to be able to express myself and I and I feel like to a large degree, I'm, I am able to express myself quite a bit, but 
Um, so I'd like to be able to um, understand people without, without being, without losing myself, I guess. Does that make sense? Yeah, can I clarify? You're really saying that you feel like when you speak to others and hear others, you, you have to compromise yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm and so the to... only reason why you would do that is for an addiction, right? Inside of yourself to be met. So there's got to be, so there's, a, there's always a reason why we do things. So there's got to be a reason. What do you get out of being empathetic? Uh, being liked, I think. You get to be liked. Yeah. Anything else? Accepted, you know. Accepted. Um, you know, here's, here's, he's a good guy, that kind of thing. Yeah, you know. so nice approval. approval. Yeah, approval, that's yeah, it. Yep. Okay. Yep. Anything else? Um, well, there's no conflict, I think. Exactly. Yeah. So you don't have to have any fear of potential conflict. Yep. Disagreement yeah. with... No disagreements. Yep. 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 So that's great. Yeah, you peaceful to, guy. You know, yeah, you get to avoid... Everyone's yeah. like, yeah. like, oh, that guy, yeah. he's awesome to hang out right, with, right. isn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah. 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 And, I, and I, you know, of course, I do believe in peace and everything, but I want to know, like, the right way to do it, you know? So. Of course, of course. So, so in this process, you're having to... You're doing all of these things. Understand that you're doing them for yourself, you're not doing that. You're not empathetic for the other person. <laughs> you're empathetic for yourself. You're empathetic to another person so that you can get a few things from them. Does that make sense? So there are selfish motivations for your empathy. <laughs> you need to firstly understand that. And once you understand that, you realise that you, the only way for to purify any form of empathy or compassion is to actually work through all of your own selfish motivations for undertaking such a course. Right? And this is what draws you away from yourself. The addictions you have towards those particular behaviours cause you to go away from yourself, and you notice that occurring. On the other hand, you also have addictions about your artistic desires and so forth. You see, the problem with, with anything that we have generally when we're in an injured state is that there are positives and negatives in any course of action. So let's look at the positives of being empathetic. It's, it, it's lovely to understand another person and why they do something. It's a very good thing. In fact, every celestial spirit understands every reason why you do everything. So they understand that. They don't go along with all the feelings you have about it because they don't agree with them. They're not in harmony with love if they did go along with those feelings, but they are at least compassionate for you having those feelings and they understand why. So that's a pure state. Agreed? Agreed? And then there's the impure state. And the impure state is doing it so that you get a whole heap of things from somebody else. Now, a celestial spirit doesn't do that with you. He, do he doesn't give you all this compassion that he has in order to get from you a whole heap of approval and acceptance and avoid your fear, his fear of you and all those other things. He doesn't do any of that. So that side of what you call your personality is a side that has two facets. One facet is a facet that's in harmony with love in the end, and there's the facet that's out of harmony with love and only in harmony with your own addictive desires. Let's look at the desire-based part of your life. The music, the art, the design-based uh, part of your life, the, what you call the expression of yourself. Right? That part, there are two parts. Some of the time you do it in order to get approval and acceptance and, and other and things like that. And have this sort of um, fulfilment of the rebellion feeling that you have with your family. Car you embody it, you know, you live in it yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And then some of it's a pure desire you know, driven by pure personality and so forth. So uh, wh what we have a, as a tendency, and what I'm trying to illustrate to you, is that initially when you ask your question, there's this sort of feeling in you of what, both parts of these things are good, but how do I balance them? And I'm saying to you, no, they're both not good yet. There's good bits in them, but they're both not pure yet because if they were pure, they would already be in balance. There would be no disharmony between the two things. They'd seamlessly happen in your life. Yes. So, so when we notice this kind of thing happening where we're trading off one part of our nature or personality for another part of our nature or personality, we've got to understand that in both parts, in both sides, there's going to be addictions that we have to face. And so what I would do is I'd go, I'd get out a notebook 
And this is what I do, as Mary knows. I've got whole I've libraries got, of notebooks yes, at home. Yes, me too. <laughs> and, and I would write down all of the addictions I get met by being empathetic to others. And I'd write down all of the things that are in harmony with God about having some empathy for others. And then, conversely, I would do the same with the other part of my life, the artistic side of my life. I'd write down all the things that are addictive about it and all the things that I are actually feel are in harmony with God about it. And then what I would do is I'd get all the ones that are addictions, lump them all together, see which ones are common, because you will find commonalities, and then work through them one by one, starting with the most important. <laughs> That's what I would do. And so I would start, let's say, the most important one was an addiction that was affecting my relationship with Mary. To me, anything that affects my relationship with God first, my relationship with Mary or, and myself next, they are the first things I'm going to focus on. So, so if I notice an addiction that's affecting my relationship with God, that's what I start with. I work on that. I work on what my fear is underneath it. I try to become aware of it intellectually. And then I allow myself to start connecting emotionally with whatever those particular things are. So that's what I would suggest to yourself as a process to go through. And it might take you some months or even years to resolve some of them. That's great. Thanks. Sarah? And if you're wondering about which is the most important one to start with, I just go with the one that feels the most scary to challenge. Because that's, that's, that's the jackpot one that's affecting the most of your relationship with God and yourself and your partner. Yeah. It's, it's the one you're so invested in staying away from. And that, that's the rapid way to grow. We can do it the other way around, but it always takes a lot longer. Yeah. What I notice is this for most people. Here's a scale of, what is a, of emotion. Like, so these are different emotions. And these are the ones that we have the least amount of fear about. So this is a scale of fear in this direction. And let's say, so that emotion there, we are least afraid of. Right? And you know what most people do first? They do that one. So they feel that emotion. And then this one here that we've got more fear of, down the track sometime. So this is time. I mean, time in that axis, right? Time. Down the track sometime, they get to feel strong enough, as they say, to do with that emotion. Does that make sense? And then sometime down the track, they realise there's this thing they're bigger fear about, and then they deal with that emotion. Now, if you can actively choose to deal with the emotion that you currently identify as your largest fear right now, can you see what the benefit of that would be? it would change lots of aspects of your life straight away. So if you could, and by the way, it's not possible to deal with your very most largest fear right now. And the reason why it's not possible is because not, not, there are fears that you have in you right now that you don't even identify, that are even larger than the ones you've identified. But if you can find the fear that is the largest one you've identified, and instead of dealing with it two years' time or 10 years' time, or wait till the law of attraction brings you a whole series of events that get too painful and then you deal with it, bring that forward and deal with it now. Right now. What will happen is your life will significantly change very rapidly if you do that. Does that make sense? If you choose, like most people do, to deal with the small one first and the next one first, and by the way, most people do who do that get to a point where one fear is what they call too big and do you know where the rest of the life is butting their head against that one fear for the rest of their life right but if you can identify what the fear is that you find the largest fear that you have right at this point in time and choose to go through the experience of it emotionally then what will happen is you, you will rapidly speed up your own progression right? that's how to rapidly speed up your own progression focus on what is your greatest fear that you know of? Because, by the way, you must remember that there are fears you don't know of that are even greater. Right? But at least if you choose to deal with the ones you know of and focus on dealing with that and actually go through it, you will speed up your progression so rapidly that, uh, that your whole life will change very rapidly as a result. Yeah. Yeah. 
it is exciting because what it does is it gives you control and not that you're seeking control, but it gives you control of how fast you can progress. Right? The persons who progress the most slowly are the persons who decide to deal with their smallest fears first. Which makes sense, doesn't it? And it's only when they feel ready, as they say, to deal with the next fear that they do go ahead and deal with it. And for this reason, um, like for a lot of women, there's a lot of sexual fears that they might have. So that's right up here. <laughs> and so for, for many relationships, this is why many men get frustrated in their relationships with women, is they often feel frustrated in their relationship with women sexually because the woman has no intention of dealing with that fear at all. She knows it's there, but she has no intention of dealing with it, right? Until some course of events cause her to be forced to dealing with it. And even then, I've seen many women pass in the spirit world, even after the events have all occurred, and still not dealing with it. So you're far better off if you know you have a fear. Bring that fear forward to now. Feel through it. Work on it. Put some effort into doing the work on it. Mm -hmm. And let yourself feel it, because that will cause so much healing of your life, but will also create so much joy. Once those biggest fears go, desires of all kinds start coming out of you that you never knew you had before. So this is a beautiful thing about any, any fear you know you have, bring it forward to now, address it now, feel it now, work your way through it now. Don't put it off. Don't wait until events catch up with you. Do it now. If a person does that, you will progress very rapidly and also experience joy in your progression. Because you imagine, if that fear is out of you, this huge one's out of you, so that if we compare the fears, here's the little fear here. There's the bar chart, if you like. We'll do a bar <laughs> chart. Here's the little fear. Here's the big fear. Which one's going to make you feel better if it's gone? <laughs> Isn't it quite obvious? This one is going to make you feel better if it's gone, isn't it? Not this one. This one will hardly have any effect on your life at all. This one, once it's gone, it's going to go, wow, I'm going to feel like a completely different person after that one's gone. So it would make sense, wouldn't it, logically, to address which fear? The one that's going to have the biggest potential positive effect on your life if it was gone. Most of us deal with life exactly the opposite way. We do everything we possibly can to avoid that fear, to make it disappear using our intellect, to make out it's not even there in the first place. We manufacture our life manufacture in a big way around it. Manufacture our life to avoid it. We create our comfort-based life to support that fear remaining in us. Right? And then we wonder why we're not happy. And then we wonder why we don't know what we desire. Then we wonder why, you know, why we don't live a life that's always changing and growing. And the reason why is because we're not addressing the fear that dominates our life. If you can address the fears that dominate your life first, then these little fears, they'll feel like little nothings. And what I see a lot of people doing is they get to this little fear and they go, wow, I dealt with this huge thing the other day. And I go, huge thing, what, what change has it had on your life? And they even have a struggle to think about how it's changed their life. <laughs> and, and I'm going, that's not a huge thing, that's a tiny little thing and your only reason why you dealt with that is because you lack the courage to deal with that. Right, isn't it, in the end? It's just an, a, 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 an attitude change in terms of what courage you have. Now, the people who deal with those big fears that they identify progress more rapidly. They become happier faster. They enjoy more of God's love as a result if they long for God's love. Their life changes more rapidly. With, you can meet them one year and meet them the next year and it's like their whole life is different because they've addressed these particular problems in their life. Now... I've met people like that. There's, there's a few people that we've met like that who deal with those. And it's, it's such a joy also to be with them because every conversation is not constructed around preventing that fear. <laughs> the average person I meet, 
Every conversation we have, every question that I answer is all about trying to prevent the fear, not, not find it. Right? And this is what we must understand about the psychology of our own fear. The psychology of our own fear is such that our fear, we have come to learn, most of us have come to learn, that our fear, these big fears, are the ones that you spend your whole life trying to prevent the feeling of. Right? And so I suggest that if your life isn't changing rapidly and, you've li and things in your life aren't improving rapidly, your relationship's not improving rapidly, it's because you want to do the gradual little things. You want to do the little fear that you can manage every time. That's why it's not changing rapidly. Once you, once you do these things, process through that, you can see logically it's going to have a huge impact on your life in so many different areas. And what I like about dealing with these big ones too is that it affects, they all affect your life in almost every area. So as soon as it's removed, your life in almost every area changes positively. Right? But the problem with these little fears is they usually only affect your life in one area. And so if you remove them, it's only that one area that changes. It still needs to be removed, of course. But it's only that one area that changes. And also, once you have faced and felt this fear, how easy do you think it's going to be to deal with this one? And it's like a molehill, right, in comparison. And so that's what it feels like in comparison. You, you go through it quite easily in comparison to these very large ones. So if you know you have certain fears, what I would be doing with my fears and what I've done with mine is I list them in order of how big they are inside of myself. And I focused on the biggest ones first. Because I find that if I don't, my life will change very slowly. And I don't know about you, but I like my life changing rapidly. Not slowly. Is that all right? So understand that obviously whenever we have um, opposing feelings occurring within us, it's because we have certain fears and therefore certain addictions in play. And don't be surprised if some of the things you think are good about yourself actually have a lot of addictions in them. And don't be surprised that some of the things you think are bad about yourself actually also have a lot of purity in them. Right? Don't be surprised of those things. Because in the end, that's the kind of things that God will show you through the process. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Should we wrap up there for today, folks? We're going to go on to dinner together, everyone. So anyone who wants to join us, we have a table booked. Thank you very much for being such a lovely audience today and allowing me to dominate proceedings. <laughs> I hope that uh, what I presented gave you some food for reflection. And, um, yeah, it's really been our pleasure to visit Philadelphia. We've really enjoyed meeting those of you who are new and seeing uh, people we've met before and seeing some growth in those people that we've met before as well. So yeah. it was really lovely. Just one thing I'd like to say in closing, which will probably take me five minutes. <laughs> no, <I> mean. <clears throat> We've had this interesting cycle occur in a lot of the places that we've visited. I'll just have a... <coughs> and that is that um, when we first went to England, we had over 100 people come along to the first seminar, right? And 90% uh, of them were totally overcloaked by spirits. Like, some of them had even their eyes rolling back in their head while they, was, while they were asking questions in the audience. They were so overcloaked by spirits there. And a lot of the things we said to them were very, very confronting, as you can imagine, because one of the things we like to help people do is get free of the influence that they are under with spirits. The next time we visited England, there were 10 people. If, if that. Who came along. I think there were seven, actually, people who came along. So that tell, told me that there weren't too many of those hundred people who wanted to hear any truth <laughs> about the spirit influence they were under, right? And those people who came to the second the year after, 
That, we had a great discussion. It was a really interesting discussion, didn't we? Very positive was, discussion, yeah. yeah. It was great. Yeah. We, we enjoyed it. So Amazing. there was sincerity in those seven. So what happened is that there was a shift in the audience to sincerity, but that meant that all the people who were not sincere didn't come anymore. Does that make sense? We went to Greece, as Katerina knows. The first time we went to Greece, um, well, the second time we went to Greece, there was close to 100 people there as well. It was probably over 100, actually. And, um, and then we went there again, and then by the fourth time we got there, there were about nine people. Thirteen. Four of them were new, though, Katerina, weren't they? Remember the family that was new? There was nine that was from the old group and four new ones. So what does that tell you? There was a whole series of things that nobody wanted to hear anymore, right? And we see this happening. And then, of course, um, we've had groups like in England, the last visit to England, we had, again, what was it, about 50 or so come. So, so then there's a whole new set of people who are more sincere who start coming along. And one of the things which is going to happen here in the States as well is this. It's going to be that many people get confronted with truth and with, you know, what we're saying to them about their life and all those other things, and many people won't want to come again. And... A lot of times that's going to be influenced by spirits, or, but, but in the end it's the individual's desires also. And what we're, going to, what we're trying to do this visit is to be a lot more frank and honest with you about what we notice within you if you're willing to know. That's what we're attempting to do. And uh, if we feel that from you, then we try to share more truth and, and, and you know, in a more honest way with you. So that, so that you can confront what is going on for yourselves. But don't be surprised if that means that there's quite a lot of people who don't want to have anything more to do with what, we're, what they're hearing from us. Does that make sense? Because we, it is our desire to not feed the addictions of people who come along in our audiences. So we're not like some kind of Tony Robbins seminar. You know, you can go along, come away all pumped, <laughs> and, uh, and, and feeling like, oh, that was so good. And, 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 uh, when can we go again? Can we go again next week? Because um, you're not going to feel that way with regard to truth. That's the reality. The reality is that truth can be very confronting. It's, uh, it, it's going to trigger a lot of your fears. It's going to uh, interfere a lot. To, if you allow your fears to dominate you, you're going to find a lot of spirit interference to never come again. And you'll also feel not inclined yourself to come again. And that's okay with us. Like we're, we're not interested in having a following. We're interested in just sharing the truth. But what I wanted to do is point that out to you, that this is a general pattern, so that you can be aware of what drives the reasons why you even come along to a seminar. In Australia, we've found that uh, at the moment, there is a deep resistance to have any more truth. They feel like they're saturated with truth. And, and so many times there's still a large number of people who come along, but many times the whole audience feels almost totally detuned from being there. And that's one of the reasons why we've stopped having so many seminars in Australia, because we feel when the audience gets saturated and can't cope with any more, and there's no point with sharing anymore when an audience is saturated. So what I'd encourage you to do, and particularly those of you who are considering coming to Texas, to come with a very open heart and be willing to um, listen to some of the feedback that we give. You're going to find a lot of the things we say quite confronting. And, uh, um, and most of the people there are going to be quite confronted. And not everyone's going to be very happy. When people get confronted, generally they're not very happy. <laughs> So allow that process to continue. And if you feel anger, feel the anger. You know, if you feel like rebelling, feel the rebellion. Don't avoid the feelings that are involved in the process of, of, of hearing truth. Because if you avoid the feelings, no progress can actually occur. So what I'd encourage you to do is to feel the feelings rather than avoid the situations. Does that make Embrace sense? whatever opportunity you have to receive truth, to see yourself 
totally embrace those things and then just be humble to what you feel in those situations. I feel that's something that got me from this really hard, angry, rebellious woman to someone who I think you told me this morning you feel I'm softer. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, Was that I just kept embracing this experience. I kept going away and then I'd come back. And but I'd Mary, you're not, Mary's not only just softer, she also now has a desire to hear truth and does not see truth as somebody not loving her. I, I actually know? see it as love and I really, from my heart, feel so grateful for it. Yeah. I, when I receive truth, especially from someone who loves me, I, I you know, sometimes I just cry at the gesture of it that it's so powerful because this thing... If I see this and deal with this, this can lead to me growing. So So in England, when I gave you the example of this English group, the English group was so spirit overcloaked that when I started, and so I knew that I had to give up what I was going to present and just present information about spirits and overcloaking and, and all that. In other words, focus on the problem. But the majority of them were so upset about me focusing on this problem. Many of them got together after I went, uh, after I left England. They got together as a meeting. They had a big meeting about how they're never going to have me again. And they all agreed, this large group... And that it was dangerous. That, it was dan- that I'm a dangerous person. Um, and they all agreed that they were never going to come to talk to me or see me again because I confronted their addictions with spirits. Or, uh, like I said, most of them were heavily overcloaked. Um, and I was confronting their addictions with spirits which they did not want to address, right? So, so this is what we need to be aware. There will be addictions inside of you that you do not want to address. And what you choose to do upon hearing some truth is going to depend to a large extent how often we're going to see each other, right? what you choose to do with that is going to, going to cause you to either rebel or to go into some kind of acceptance and go through some emotions. And what I'd encourage you to do is to, when you feel that feeling of rebellion, start to see it as just a feeling of rebellion rather than seeing it as something that I did <laughs> to create your rebellion, right? Because all I'm trying to do, I'm not trying to harm you here. What I'm trying to do is help you become more loving and more truthful and have a, more, a, a much happier life. That's all I'm trying to do. And I, I know very, very firmly that I know, I know the way that that can happen because I've personally experienced that way that it can happen. And what I'm encouraging you to do is to follow the same way, the same method, if you like. I don't need you to follow me. I don't need you to do what we do, but I would love to see each of you in a year's time when we see you again, which probably will be about that time before we see you again, probably. I would love to see a more a happier group of people who feel more love for each other, feel more love for God, feel like their lives have changed, feel like their situation has improved, feel like they have less fears. That's what I would love to see. And how that happens is really completely up to yourselves. I have very little to do with it except by sharing some truth with you. The rest of the work is really up to you. And and what I would like you to do, to encourage you to do, is to do it, do the work, rather than just as soon as you get something confronted, run away. That's what I'd love to encourage you to do. So perhaps we can leave you with that. Mary has not run away from me, or if she did... (laughs) She ran away for very short periods of time, right? <laughs> so, so you might have ran away four or five times, right? Yeah, um, but, but I always came back. Yeah. But she's always come back uh, because, because there's this desire in her for the truth. There's this desire in her to become more loving. And I feel her example is what many people like um, criticise, but actually her example is what most people need to do is to follow because she's been a person who has had this desire even though the emotions are hard, even though the feelings are hard. She still had that desire. So I'd like to, you to, I'd like to encourage you to follow her example on that, on that issue. 
So if you do, we will probably see each other <laughs> in a year or two. So I'm not sure when it will be, you know, uh, our lives are very unplanned. Um, and we, we would definitely enjoy to see you guys again. And uh, we've, we have really enjoyed you as an audience. We've felt you've yes. been pretty open emotionally. There was only a few times when you shut down emotionally. One time was when we were discussing a responsibility, personal responsibility. <laughs> There was quite a heavy shutdown at that point. And so that tells you that many of you don't want to take personal responsibility. But uh, generally, the spirit, the feeling coming from you, very open and wanting to discover more truths and so forth. And it's been really enjoyable sharing with you and answering your questions the last couple of days. Can we thank our hosts again, actually, yeah. and the fact that... That we're enabled to be here through the donations of other people and, and uh, some of your donations. Some of, of your donations have helped us be here today. So thank you very, very much. Yes, yeah, so thank you. Yeah. And for those of you who are uh, going to San Diego or to uh, Texas, is uh, there who else? Is there anyone doing that? Is there anyone here doing that? A few of you. Yep. So yeah. we'll see a few of you then. For the, for the rest of you. Um, it will probably be some time before we see you. We don't have any plans over the next six months to travel, so, um, so it will be some time after that probably that we'll see you again. And that depends very largely on desires of, of groups of people as to where we go. Mm -hmm. so, but we look forward to meeting your desires when you have them, <laughs> attempting to at least. <laughs> uh, it's in um, near Austin, isn't it? It's about... Yeah. Wimberley, W-I-M-B-E-R-L-E-Y, I think it is, Wimberley, uh, yeah. in Texas. But it's about three quarters of an hour from Austin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And I think there is a cut-off date though for letting. October 24th. October 24th. Yes. That's the only event where you need to actually make a reservation. And yeah. we haven't organised the event. We're just. Uh, Kind of guests. We're yeah. guests coming along yeah. <laughs> as well. So um, we're just going to rock up and spend a bit of time with a group of people. Basically, basically that's what we were hoping to do. Um, we're not calling it a retreat. We, Mary and I basically call it a thing. <laughs> <laughs> that thing in Texas. That we have no idea. Yeah. No idea what. <laughs> we're having this thing in Texas. So. <laughs> um, it's it's yeah. not a retreat or anything like that. It's just a, a chance to spend some time together with a group of people. In an informal in setting. In a more informal manner, although we will be having sort of gatherings where we chat. Mm -hmm. And we will be doing some filming so that it benefits some other people who are not there yeah. as well. But thanks for your time, guys. And And we wish you well in your endeavour to get closer to God. Yeah. Try the experiments. Yeah, do that. Yeah. <laughs> Look after yourselves, eh?